Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the second part of Supported Employment Fidelity Reviewer Training with Paul Ferris. And this is Don Miller. Um, and we'll get started here in just a minute. Uh, Darren will be joining us as well, but he'll probably be in a little later. He's, he's uh, stuck in a meeting that I hopped out of. <laughs> I hope it's nice and sunny where you are also. And uh, I just want to start the day by saying um, we'll utilize the chat box again. If at any point in time you would rather verbally ask a question, we can unmute you. So keep, keep in mind that that's an option as well. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Paul. Okay, great. Thanks, Dawn. Um, for today, uh, I won't do any sort of uh, sharing exercise uh, since we did that yesterday. Um, but I will tell you all, when we get the the time and the chance to be together face to face, um, we'll have all kinds of great uh, activities and exercises planned for us to get to know each other a little bit better. Um, so uh, I know we have another sort of long haul today virtually, but we're going to get through it just fine. You guys were great to talk with yesterday, and I'm not blowing smoke. Um, you guys had great insightful questions uh, and a lot of care and concern about wanting to get it right. And so I think that's just that's just wonderful to hear. Um, I, I would worry more if we were doing this and, and the audience had zero questions or zero comments. That would that would really concern me. Um, so keep the questions coming, like Dawn said. We'll have the same format today that we did yesterday. So we'll talk for a little bit, take a break, talk for a little bit, take a break. One of those breaks will be a lunch like we did yesterday. Um, and we have a little bit of work to finish the Fidelity Manual and the Fidelity Scale. And then we're just going to kind of uh, crank the steering wheel and drive right into the Fidelity Review process. Um, and the good news is the Fidelity Review process, if you've gone out and already looked at the Fidelity Manual that's out there on IPSWorks.org, the Fidelity Review process that we're going to talk about is really I, uh, it's identified and delineated very concretely in that same fidelity manual. So when we talk about um, you know having the manual with you, if you have any questions, consult the manual. Even for fidelity review process questions, the manual will be a tremendous help for you. Uh, so please, um, please, please, please save it to your computer or something like that um, so that you can access it. Uh, if you can print it out, great. Um, I also know that being 237 pages, um, people may not want to print that out so i get it um i think i'm not sure if they still do but um, at one point in time i'm not sure if you know don the ips works team ips employment center team um you you could uh send them a, a message and say you'd like a basically like a spiral bound uh copy of the fidelity manual and they would send it to you um i don't know that that's still available um you might have to surf around the website a little bit sure. yeah i'm not sure either i think if it is they're having you pay for it um i, I think there is an option to buy one as okay. opposed to having to print it yourself. Uh, might be cheaper to print it yourself but i know a lot of us don't have access to a decent printer right at the moment so yeah yeah maybe <laughs> you know maybe that's step number two dawn of an organization who's interested in um talking with you and Darren about that incentive to become a fidelity reviewer uh, in the state of Washington, maybe step number two after that is with some of the incentive monies, they could get themselves a nice hardbound copy, a uh, spiral bound copy of the fidelity review manual. Definitely. Just an idea, just an idea. Um, so if anybody has questions, we can just kind of start with um, kind of putting out there that if anybody has questions that, that occurred to them yesterday after our training or during the training, but maybe you didn't have the opportunity to ask it, um, you are certainly welcome to throw those out right now. And we can kind of start with your questions or, you know, kind of like, a, you know, on the as I was eating dinner last night, I got to thinking, what happens when this, when you see this at an agency? Those are all the questions I would expect that you, that you have kind of rolling through your head as we're talking yesterday and today. Um, so feel free to pop those into the question box and we'll get to them. Um, and I'll do just like I did yesterday. Um, I'll talk a little bit and then I'll try to make sure either through Dawn and Darren or just kind of going and looking myself that if there are questions, we'll kind of stop what we're doing and answer those too. So um, thank you all for coming back. And let's just go ahead and kind of get to it. Um, we're in the section, the third section, if you remember, of the Fidelity Scale. We're in the services section. And this is set up in a very similar way to 
the other two sections we looked at yesterday. It starts right out of the gates with work incentives planning. Uh, and so this is really exactly what it sounds like, that people who are receiving employment services from us have an opportunity to talk with a benefits planner, a certified benefits planner, about how employment income would impact their benefits. Um, <clears throat> and so I think benefits um, includes pretty much everything that you could even think of. So they've got right here, I'm going to try to use the pen. I've, I was thinking last night, I was on the treadmill, and I thought, you know, Paul, you're not very good at using the pen um, when you're doing one of these. So I'm going to try like heck, uh, uh, get fancy in 2021. So benefits include all of these listed social security medical benefits any subsidies for housing or medication food stamps um, spouse income or spouse benefits um, dependent children benefits retirement benefits there's railroad benefit i mean there's there's so many different types of benefits somebody could get or have have some sort of connection with that that the reason uh, we really look for a trained and certified benefits planner is because they they have the expert knowledge in what all of these benefits mean, what all the thresholds and qualifications are, um, and it's 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 benefits planning to a level that is greater than if you just said, oh, go, you know, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Client, um, if you just make an appointment at Social Security, they can talk to you about your benefits. It's important to note, not, that's not wrong, but Social Security really only knows about Social Security associated benefits. They don't know about other benefits like they do Social Security. So the benefits planners, are uh, they are vital to helping us kind of get to, oh my, now I see, I, I, <laughs> I've got my circle that won't leave now. There we go. Um, benefits planners are vital to helping people understand exactly how employment will impact their income and their benefits. Um, so in Washington, I, th I think if I remember correctly, Dawn, there are, I don't remember the number, but there are trained benefits planners available to providers in the state of Washington. Yeah. Um, there are, there are okay. a few. Okay. Yeah. And, and then there are agencies that um, will contract, there there are WIPAs that will contract with, with other agencies to do benefits planning for them. But one okay. of the things to note that we talked to the Westat folks, our Pathways to Employment website has a benefits estimator on it, and the Westat folks had said that that would certainly count um, in some, <clears throat> excuse me, in some fashion towards benefit planning if agencies help the person to do that benefits estimator, print it mm -hmm. out, and put it in their file. Yep. Um, yeah, usually there's some sort of, um, I don't know what the right way to put it. There's, there's like a worksheet. If you so in Illinois, and I think in most states, there are fewer benefits planners than probably everybody really needs to have available. Uh, so we have a lot of sort of waiting for benefits planning appointments that happens, um, and I've seen that in other states as well. But really, the evidence of it when you look through a chart, this is how you'd know it is through the you know chart review for sure. Um, you, you could if there are enough benefits planners in the state, you could do an interview with a benefits planner. And we've done that historically in Illinois, but as the numbers dwindled, they've identified that they are no longer able to help, excuse me, with fidelity reviews, um, because that was a multiple times weekly appointment for them was to, to do fidelity review interviews at agencies across the state of Illinois. So, um, so they have stopped that since, um, but we don't penalize people for it. But we do look for the evidence in the record, and the evidence in the record usually is some sort of worksheet. Um, and so the benefits planner sort of um, website that you're talking about, Dawn, I think could be evidence. And as you can see from the fidelity scale, um, you know, if you start at one, like we talked yesterday, you kind of start at either a one or a five and, and see, can you, you know, is that enough or do you need to work you know, to the next one. Um, to get a score of one, it says work incentives planning is not readily available or easily accessible to most clients served by the agency. So, you know, if you go in and you talk and they say in interviews, yeah, we do benefits planning, and then you go look in the chart and it's a conversation without any sort of worksheet or it's the staff in the IPS program um, setting up an appointment for the client at Social Security, um, but, you know, I, I think that's probably um, a one, a two, um, you know, you're not really taking control of it. A two here says that we give client contact information about where to access this information. Um, a three is where it starts to really show that we've had some sort of discussion about changes in benefits. 
Um, and then from there, you know, it just gets kind of uh, sort of more intense or more rigorous and more rigorous. So um, uh, I wish I, if, if I would have thought about it, I would have had the copy of the worksheet that I could show everybody that uh, benefits planners put together. Um, just because it kind of, it kind of sticks out in a chart, to be honest with you, because it looks different than you know the standard sort of clinical documentation. So, um, again, this one's fairly straightforward. Not a lot to it. Just kind of did it happen or didn't it happen? And if it did happen, you know, to what degree is really what you're looking for. Um, and and really, the IPS team uh, is very forthcoming with this information. It doesn't none of none of the items in the fidelity scale there's no advantage for a provider to be coy or, um, you know, kind of uh, hide information from me. That's what I mean. It's not like a traditional audit. Sometimes when you go someplace, you can tell they're kind of in audit mode because they answer with, you know, one word answers. They try to not elaborate um, when you ask them a question and they give you an answer. And sometimes you have to give permission, like, you know, hey, um, more information is actually better in this particular review. So, you know, the less information you give us, the less we're able to score. Uh, and so sometimes if we encounter a lot of resistance like that, we will talk to the team and just kind of say, you know, you might want to alert your other staff that you have lined up for interviews that they are welcome to speak freely. Um, and in fact, it's to your advantage organizationally for them to speak freely, uh, because if they're tight lipped or if they don't want to say too much, you know, what happens is you come back and you don't have a lot of information. And if you don't have a lot of information, it's really hard to arrive at a score in, in most of the items. So, um, you know, sometimes you'll find in a fidelity review, giving permission is, is a really important um, kind of act that you can do as a fidelity reviewer. If we move into disclosure, which is the next item in this uh, section here, let me scroll down through that. Disclosure is what it sounds like. I'm sure you're all kind of aware of what disclosure is. Um, this is another item with components. Uh, and so it's a little trickier than the components we saw before in other items where, you know, there are five components and um, five total points in the item. This one has got four components. So it's a score of five if four components are present and the one then would be if none are present. So uh, a little thing, but it's just worth pointing out. It's just it's just uh, a little wrinkle. And here are the components right here. Um, I'm trying to flip back and forth between the manual and the scale for you. So if you get confused at any time, you want me to go back to the manual or something like that, please put a question out there and I'm happy to do that. Um, so the first component here under disclosure is that employment specialists do not require all clients to disclose their psychiatric disability at the work site in order to receive services. Um, that should be pretty easy for you to find out um, just through some simple questioning of the IPS team. Uh, in fact, you can just ask this directly, you know, do you require all clients to disclose their disability at the work site in order to receive your services? Um, and I'm I'm guessing 10 out of 10 times you're going to hear, no, absolutely not. The client gets to choose. So almost every organization, I think every organization I've ever been to gets that gets that component point uh, right out of the gates. Uh, employment specialists offer to discuss with clients the, the costs and benefits or pros and cons of disclosure at the work site in advance of them disclosing. Uh, and then further, you know, uh, the employment specialists describe how disclosure relates to requesting accommodations. And um, for this, I, I look for evidence in the chart. When you talk about it in an interview, everybody's going to say they do all these things. It, and so I kind of look to the charts to validate it. So it, it would not be uncommon for you to sit down with an employment specialist and talk to them about disclosure. And they say, oh, yeah, I weigh out the pros and cons. Um, you know, we have a worksheet that we do, uh, and it's part of our regular routine prior to being in front of an employer or prior to applying to uh, an organization is we have this conversation about disclosure. And that sounds great. So when you go to the charts then, and you're doing a chart review, ideally, you, you kind of confirm that in the chart and you see a worksheet, a pros and cons worksheet. There's one available on the IPS Works website um, that if, if people aren't using a worksheet, my first recommendation is use the pros and cons worksheet available on ipsworks.org. Uh, it's free. It's publicly available. They can, you know, scan it into their medical record if they have an electronic medical record, or they can just print one out when they need it. Um, it's a very easy way for them to get this award, this point awarded if they didn't get it awarded. Um, so 
the other thing that kind of gets uh, tricky here is some organizations will point to the release of information as evidence of um, disclosure. And one of the challenges, I think, with most releases of information that I've seen, that they don't really get into things like the pros and cons of disclosure. They really just check the boxes of necessary uh, information to make it a valid release. So, you know, releasing to whom, what are we releasing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if, it, if they only have releases of information in their medical record or in their chart, this point, you'd really want to drill into the questioning a little bit with, with this particular point. Where's the evidence of the disclosure uh, conversation? And that may be in individual progress notes or contact notes. And that'll be a real, um, you'll have to budget some time if you're going to have to click through contact note after contact note after contact note. Uh, so quick tip for fidelity reviews. If it goes to this level and you find something that, you know, the evidence is in contact notes, rather than spend four and a half hours reviewing charts, trying to find that one contact note, I, I try to put the responsibility back on the team and say, okay, for for Jane, this client that you say, you know, um, you, you had, uh, you know, disclosure conversations with, can you find me the note where you talk about this disclosure with Jane? And they'll either find it and print it for you or they'll cruise through their medical record and take you right to it. Um, because otherwise, you know, I'm not familiar with everybody's charts or medical records and sifting through every single note, um, there's a high likelihood I'm just going to miss something. And so to be the most fair, okay, you say it's in there, great. Can you produce it for me? Um, and save a bunch of time, basically. Um, and I know we've got a question. I want to get through two more of these bullet points, and then I'll flip over to questions. Uh, so the third component is that the employment specialists discuss specific information to be disclosed. So not just disclosure, but you know what level of disclosure, if you want to think about it that way, and offers examples of what could be said to employers. Um, so this is certainly what I've said before. When you're talking with the employment specialists and the clients, you'd... you'd um, be able to maybe hear this in an interview, but again, it it ought to be captured in the, the chart as well. Um, so uh, that would be to me a lock if you hear it in an interview and you see it in the chart. Uh, that would be an easy way to say without question, yes. Um, and then the last point here is that employment specialists discuss disclosure on more than one occasion. Um, and one of the challenges with this one is often there is um, there is uh, very good documentation in the beginning of the job search about disclosure uh, and then as the job search continues over time <clears throat> the documentation on disclosure is a little weaker uh, so i have seen organizations and i recommend this too um, you know that pros and cons worksheet i mean it doesn't have to be a one-time worksheet they can fill it out for employer a or potential employer a and if the client doesn't get that job or want that job and moves, you know, starts investigating employer B, they can kind of see how the pros and cons they already listed are relevant to employer B, put a new date at the bottom, you know, sign it with it with the next date. So they've got maybe two signatures or, you know, two touches on it. Um, and that would be a way to show ongoing conversations. And then again, also, um, um, also you, you would probably see this in contact notes as well. So it's another one um, that's probably going to be in the contact notes or progress notes. If we move into, let me scroll through all these darn components, golly. Ongoing work-based vocational assessment. So this is the career profile, right? Vocational assessment. Um, occurs over two to three sessions, is updated with information from work experience. Um, it contains information about preferences, experiences, skills, et cetera. Um, I'm going to flip over since that's so wordy. Um, you know, for this one, it's another one like we talked about yesterday where a score of a five um, is, is essentially a re reiteration of the definition of this item. So, you know, if you, um, if you see every single thing, then you know it's a five. Where you start um, <clears throat> kind of getting into the four here is it's got some or statements in the scoring and 
this section in particular has several or statements. So for a score of a four, it says the vocational assessment occurs over two to three sessions in which interests and strengths are explored. The specialists help clients learn from each job experience and work with the treatment team to analyze job loss, job problems, job success. They do not document those lessons learned in the vocational profile or the vocational profile is not updated on a regular basis. So you could have an organization that meets all the criteria for a score of a five, except uh, they don't have any evidence that they update it, and that alone will bump them back to a score of a four. Um, I've had a lot of discussions with organizations over the years about when should you or when could you update a vocational assessment or a career profile, and really, I think the answer is whenever you feel the need, there's no prescription for how often it needs to be touched. Um, at a minimum, any sort of job experience or job loss or anything like that is good to go back and look at the career profile. It doesn't mean you have to change it. You could go back and look and verify that all is still correct and have you know, the second date of, you know, the date of review on it at the bottom and that would count. Uh, so, um, you know, talking with, with organizations about sort of the how of some of this is really important in your interviews. Um, uh, so a score of three here, um, they assist clients in finding competitive jobs without systematically reviewing interests, interests, experiences, and strengths, and do not routinely analyze job loss for lessons learned. Um, so if they were an organization that had a career profile that did not include interests, experiences, strengths, and they didn't analyze any job loss, that would be a score of a three. Um, and it goes, you know, kind of, it kind of titrates down from there uh, within each of the scoring items here. So um, you'll want to ask questions in the interviews of the employment specialists and the IPS supervisor about their vocational assessment or career profile, um, how they do it, you know, what kind of information they generally put on it. And then again, you'll kind of confirm that when you look in the medical record. And it's often too, it's important for you all to know, um, it often is the case that like if Dawn and I and you are all on a fidelity review together, it may be that you and I have some of the interviews while Dawn is doing the chart review. So again, I'm gonna kind of go back to what we really talked about yesterday with making sure you take great notes that make sense to you, that help you arrive at a score, but also really leaning on your fidelity review team because you won't score that item alone. You'll score it with information that Dawn has gleaned from doing the chart reviews. Sorry, I put you on chart reviews, Dawn. Um, most people don't like that. Um, so Dawn is gonna have to <laughs> deliver the chart review sort of information for you and I to kind of corroborate our interview information. Um, and hopefully that makes sense to folks. And I don't wanna be a Johnny OneNote and the one thing you remember coming out of these two days together with Dawn and Darren and I is that, you know, you need to take, well, maybe I do want you to remember that. Uh, <laughs> take good notes and be a good Fidelity Review, you know, uh, team member. Um, I don't want it to be the only thing you pick up, but it is important and we can't really underscore it enough, I don't think. Um, because you really get hamstrung when you're trying to score if you don't have all the information that you heard during the fidelity review. Um, and if, you're, if your day is like mine, um, two weeks after a fidelity review, it's gonna be really difficult for you to remember specifically what you heard in an, in an interview um, without notes. Uh, and, and then that just poses a real challenge for us from a scoring perspective. All right, I had to take a drink before this one. I hate to say this to you all, and, and Dawn, we may have to just monitor for how many people drop off the call after I say this out loud, but we're getting into the part of Fidelity Reviews where you're gonna have to learn a little math if you don't know how to do some of this stuff. So um, if we have a mass exodus from this call, that that's the problem. Um, rapid job search for competitive job, um, and a couple other items after this do require us to sketch out some quick math um, to make sure we can arrive at a score. Uh, it seems easy, right? The, um, the time between the assessment and first face-to-face -face employer contact by the client occurs within 30 days after program entry, right? Uh, the first thing I'll say here, I like to really point out um, is to calculate rapid job search. Um, you'll really want to help the organization understand 
how you're defining program entry, okay? It's the client's first appointment with the IPS specialist. Some agencies have intakes, some have um, assessments first, and then, you know, this or that or the other. So if they're trying to calculate their own rapid job search, um, it could be a different number than you arrive at in a fidelity review if they're not using the appropriate program entry date. So we're just going to use the date of the client's first appointment with the IPS specialist, okay? That's the first thing I'll say about this one. <clears throat> Moving forward, we're going to talk to them in interviews, yes. Um, we're really going to want to hear from them how they focus on that. It's also important for you to know um, this part here. When you're talking with the IPS supervisor, you're going to want to know, do they track the number of days from when the client first meets with the team to the first employer contact? If they don't track that information, you cannot score them higher than a four. Even if their score is squarely below 30 days, you can't score them higher than a four if the supervisor doesn't track it. Um, and, and some of these that we're going to talk about today have these sort of... Um, caveats. And so uh, if you have a physical copy of this in front of you, put an asterisk by it. If you don't, if you've got a saved version and you can, I don't know, highlight or draw on it or something like that, um, that's a good thing for you to remember. So what we're going to calculate here is the median, not the mean or the average. We're going to calculate the median. Um, so Christy has a, a comment here, question, is this debatable? Meaning, is the first day the client met with employment specialist flexible? What if they just wanted to learn about the program and haven't decided yet? Christy, this is a great question. Um, so a lot of this depends, right? So if you get there and the person you're asking about that just wanted to learn more about the program is on the caseload list, it's going to count, right? If, it's, if that person's name is not on the caseload list, then I don't know that a reviewer would ever know an employment specialist met with that person. And so think about it this way too. You're gonna have caseload lists that are provided to you as a fidelity reviewer. From those caseload lists, the team is going to select 10 charts. And of those 10 charts, we're gonna interview some of those clients. So there's gonna be some intersection between the caseload list, the charts you review, and the clients you speak with during a fidelity review process. So in your scenario, I, I just don't know that you would ever know that they had this one-off um, appointment with a client unless they included that person on their caseload list. And then the way it would look is, let's say they showed up on the caseload list and for some reason the organization decided to pull this chart for us to review. We'd go look at the chart and we'd say, well, they, they met with you on January 1st and they have yet to be in front of an employer and here it is. Um, February, or let's say March 1st. So we're at what, 58 days, 50, 59 days. You know, so um, it, it would it would be like a false negative almost that appointment. And hopefully, in a fidelity review, uh, in the context of a fidelity review, you know, you could say while you're looking at that chart, hey, how come Bob he hasn't? I mean, it doesn't look like there's any job search activity. He hasn't had a career profile. Um, what what is 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 he hard to engage or what you know what's happening with Bob's case and hopefully they would tell you exactly what your question was well he just wanted to know more about the program and then he never decided that he wanted to follow up with us to which I would say you know what let's let's throw this chart out I would like that doesn't seem to be an open that doesn't even seem to be somebody who's receiving employment services to me so let's kick that out and get it we'll sub in another chart um, hopefully that makes sense. Um, let's see here, we got another question. This year due to COVID, I have a lot of clients who are opting to put their job searches on hold because of both mental health and concerns for exposure in the community. Is this type of exception factored into scoring? The short answer, Rebecca, is, you know, uh, not technically. Um, again, though, you know, the organization sort of gets to present us the cases that, that we look at. So um, I, I would imagine, unless it is, you know, wholesale problems where we're nobody's following up. I would imagine that um, most organizations are going to just give us the charts where people are following up. Um, you know what I mean? So, and I don't mean to say like they kind of uh, 
you know, cook the books or teach to the test or whatever the right phrase is in that. But, um, you know, the fidelity scale is kind of like the fidelity scale. So in terms of exceptions or um, accommodations for things, there's there's not a ton of it in there. It's not There's not a lot of flexibility in that way. The flexibility, I think, is in what the providers uh, provide as evidence um, to show the work they do. Um, so uh, there is some guidance on COVID-19 that Dawn referenced yesterday from the IPS Employment Center. Um, but I, when I have looked at it, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dawn, I don't think it goes to that level of uh, direction with regards to COVID-19. No, I, I don't think it does either. And as I recall, um, and and kind of what I've heard them say in the meetings that we attend is is they'll sort of send out more direction as they have it. Um, yeah. I, I think, like many of us, the West App folks thought this would be over and done with. Um, <laughs> yeah. <last year. laughs> and and kind of still going under that that uh, you know un uncertainty. When is it going to end? And do we need to give more information? It sounds like they will do that at some point. Yeah, I think at some point we all assumed this would be sort of a 90-ish day conversion to virtual services or, or whatever. And then it just, I joke that March 2020 never really ended. Uh, <laughs> we're on our you know, 12th <laughs> month of March of 2020. So um, yeah. <laughs> uh, there, there's, no, there's no playbook for this sort of thing. And hopefully it's a once in a lifetime event, right? Um, we don't have to do this every three years or something like that. Um, so I'm not surprised there's not really specific guidance. And then just to be real fair too, if you're the IPS Employment Center, there's only so many modifications you can make on a regular basis to your fidelity scale before you, it, you don't have validity to it any longer. If you keep changing it, it's, it's no longer the same evidence-based practice that you started with. So I will say their changes, their big changes are few and far between. Um, they they give guidance on how to interpret the fidelity scale, but in general, the fidelity scale doesn't change a whole lot, um, which as a reviewer is really good, right? Um, you kind of stick to the knitting and then you just have to stay apprised of the guidance you receive. Um, so that's a good question though, Rebecca. Paul asks, is applying to jobs online counted as first employer contact or is it only counting in-person employer contact? Great question. Uh, let me take you right to the manual. Uh, to score this item, and I think somebody has their hand up, by the way, Dawn. Uh, to score this item, only the employer contacts that are made in person are counted. Contacts by phone or email are not included in the calculation. And really, the way it's always been taught to me is um, in front of a hiring manager. So, like, if you apply online, I don't know that that goes to a hiring manager first. That might go through some sort of algorithmic sort of sort first, and then if it passes whatever the thresholds are for that sort, then maybe it goes to uh, the hiring manager. Maybe. Maybe it doesn't go to the hiring manager. Maybe it goes to a store manager first. And then if the store manager likes the look of the application, then they pass it along to the person in HR that's the hiring manager. Those are the things you don't know, which is all the more reason for us to have this as an item on the fidelity scale. Uh, so um, no, the online stuff wouldn't count. And I know that's kind of like, yeah, but 2020 was a disaster for everything face-to-face. But again, they, they don't really accommodate or change the fidelity scale often as much as they do give guidance. Um, so if that makes sense. Um, and then let's see here. Uh, the process to get them in is pretty lengthy and period of waiting time, but we've been able to place them in, says L. Okay, that's good to know. Um, so I want to get back to the math of this one. Actually, Don, do you want to try, somebody's got their hand up, if you want to try to. Um, Paul? Yes. Oh, okay. This is Darren. Don just uh, had a step away, and it okay. looks like the person who had their hand raised was the same person who put the question in oh, the box. Got it. And one thing I just want to add is that I know in Washington State with FBS that we see people having an appointment, like was addressed a little bit earlier, see if people are interested. Then they might, you know, fill out the FCS authorization and then send that in because the person's not really getting services yet until that authorization is complete. So we know there's a little bit of uh, room where there is a delay before uh, we you start working with them. So that's something, you know, I know people provide during the reviews is some of that documentation. And we do have that conversation. Okay. 
So it looks know. like this person is asking to be unmuted. I will give it a try. I can't help you with that. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> You're on your own. <laughs> yeah, it's just like I don't see my unmute button. It looks like I would have to uh, do it all. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not able to unmute you um, right now. I don't show anybody as being muted on my screen. So, yeah, my apologies. I'm not able to unmute right now. Yeah, and feel free other... to type that question in. You know, we're happy to answer it. We don't want to you know we don't want you to leave here with the question unanswered so feel free to pop that into the questions box and we'll get to it um i'll just touch on real quickly uh, two things one darren thanks for chiming in on that um i think that's one of the limitations with the fidelity scale that we have is that each state does things so vastly different and interprets you know federal rules differently so the one of the challenges if you're a fidelity reviewer that goes to let's say just two different states um, is that you may find that the state process in one state is different like let's say it's the department of vocational rehab process is different in one state than it is in another which leads to a delay in people getting quote unquote opened for ips services so yet here you are doing an evaluation of fidelity review on the provider not vr so how do you account for the weight that has that the agency has no control over? And unfortunately, there's really no flexibility in the scale to kind of, you know, recalibrate that. It's kind of like, yeah, it's 30 days from first appointment with the IPS provider to getting in front of an employer. So that's a limitation, I think, to the fidelity scale um, is that you, it doesn't account for variability in process between state, not good or bad, just you know, it's it's a it's something we got to figure out. I think um, at each fidelity review. The other thing I wanted to mention was this kind of idea of the median, using the median to score this. The fidelity manual lays it out very very nicely in their examples. So, the IPS supervisor in the first example here, the IPS supervisor does not track the number of days to first employer contact. Reviewers read client records and find the following. So. Let me stop here and say, you're gonna look at a number of charts. Sometimes it's 10, some agencies give you more than that. Um, you, you, a 10 is nice because you're gonna arrive at a nice percentage with 10 charts, right? So the median is once you go through the charts and you note these numbers are the numbers of days between the first appointment and first employer contact. Once you know all those numbers, you have to put them in order, low to high. And then the median is really, you just find the absolute middle. So the circle is around 29 and 31 because it's got four numbers on the left and four numbers on the right. That's an easy middle, right? So what you do then, since you have two numbers in the middle, is you just take the average of the two numbers and they have that math down here, um, 60 divided by two is 30. So their average is, thir the median I should say is, is 30 days. But as we mentioned before, because the supervisor doesn't track this information specifically, you can only give them a four, even though they're in the range. Um, and it looks like L did uh, enter a question in there. Um, uh, so I wanted to add to the woman earlier, the strategy I have used since COVID issue is when clients say they don't want to work, I would give them time and let them be and follow up with them in a week and let them know about the jobs available I found. And in most cases, they will eventually tell you that they want to give it a try. However, you always want to let them know that employers will not have the positions open very long. So it helps a lot. That's a really good strategy, L. I like that a lot where you kind of... Um, meet the client where they're at but you also sort of um you know kind of have some i don't don't take this the wrong way but you have some bait there with some job leads when you follow back up with them uh so it's not just a hey do you need are you still interested it's more of a if you're still interested i found these these positions that might be available um and yeah positions at least i don't know about you all but um the employment team where i work they found in 2020 even though uh, companies were, were closing or going remote um, and businesses were closing, there were still a lot of jobs available and there were, the employers were like wanting them filled immediately. Um, so we, we, we really had a lot of work last year um, for sure. Continuing to go through the examples here, we've got another median with, you've got, you know, you've got your string of numbers here. Um, and then this one uh, with the 33 circled, you've got six numbers on the left, six numbers on the right, number in the middle is 33 the score is a four here 
and and here's why they've got ranges in the rapid search for competitive jobs so to get a four that all that math median works out to between 31 and 60 days so there's a lot of flexibility so uh, an organization that gets people in in front of an employer 60 days gets the same score as somebody who gets somebody in front of the employer within 31 days so um, you know there's a tremendous incentive if, if an agency has a score of 31 on this one 31 days um, boy if they could figure out just how to tweak that a little bit they could have a five uh, on this item so it could be uh, it could be that very small changes um, can lead to big big gains here um, and L goes on to say it's very important for you to step back once the fear resides and uh, in them and trying to come back to them to follow up I agree uh, a lot of times it's scary right for the folks we serve to think about going to work um, and I think I think in a way too our approach to clients going back to work that's so um, welcoming and, and encouraging is different than most clients have experienced if they've been in our services for a long period of time like pre-IPS it used to be if somebody expressed interest in going to work that they'd have a lot of clinicians saying oh you're not ready and you know why don't you do this first and if that works then you could go look at employment so for them to come in and just kind of say I'm thinking about work and have us all say sure you know look what are you doing this afternoon I think it's a difference maker for a lot of folks and it's scary um, it's scary they got to kind of uh, warm up to it I think is is the best way I can think of um, so you're gonna, you're gonna find clear. go ahead I'm go ahead. Paul. I was gonna say to Elle if you want to be unmuted I can still do that I apologize I stepped away for a minute and um, uh, it, it seemed as though Darren was looking at it and trying to figure out how to unmute and sometimes the system doesn't behave well so if you still need to be unmuted haven't had a chance to really answer what you wanted to say let me know and I'll unmute you thank you Don okay it looks like we got it taken care of um, the long way through through chat right um, <laughs> <clears throat> Moving on, in, individualized job search um, is exactly what it sounds like. And as you can see here, there's a lot of possible sources of information for this item. Uh, when I do fidelity reviews, I find the real um, sort of concrete evidence here is I, I try to connect what I see in the career profile or vocational assessment uh, with um, either a job search plan or if there is no job search plan, the um, job development log for that particular client. So the idea is if in the career profile or vocational assessment, somebody said they wanted to be a dishwasher or work in the food industry, and the job search plan says the same thing, and they got employed as a um, you know oil change mechanic, as a fidelity reviewer, your first question should be, how did you get from restaurant industry or food industry to, you know, like Jiffy Lube technician? Like, what? tell me what, what changed with the client. Uh, and you can ask those questions of the employment specialist that's assigned to that client. And usually when you see that, what happens is they neglected to update things, like they neglected to update the job search plan, or they didn't make a notation that even though that's what they wanted, that's what the client preferred, they also said, I'll take any job that you can find me. I need money right now um, because that happens too, right? <clears throat> so what I encourage organizations to do when I hear that in a fidelity review is you can still update the record of the job search plan. You can still go in and say the person, you know, long-term goal is food industry. Um, and you can make a note that says, however, um, right now today, they need money to pay for medications or, you know, whatever. So they're willing to look for open positions period they, there's not a preference for the short term and you could go on and on about you know well is it better to look for the long you know meet the long-term goal or is it better to meet the short-term goal um, but at the end of the day if you're the client who needs money you need money like yesterday so I, I can really sympathize with somebody who says I'll take whatever you've got um, I, I don't I don't think there's anything wrong with that uh, but again the philosophy or the principle behind all of this is that as an organization we're meeting people's needs and preferences as opposed to saying, here's what's available. Uh, so um, that's really the difference to me. Um, let me look here. There's a couple, um, I think there's a couple statements in here 
um, that I wanted to point out. I might be thinking of a different one. Uh, oh, here it is. When there's no evidence of a documented job search plan, you cannot score higher than a three. Um, here's another good example. IPS specialists base most job searches on stated employment goals without further exploration. They do not help people think about job matches based on strengths, lessons learned from previous jobs, personality, what the person enjoys, symptoms if present, substance use if applicable, etc. They do not attempt to share information about jobs that people may not know about. Reviewers do not score higher than a two. And if you flip over to the um, fidelity scale, you can see this is set up as a sort of a range of percents. Um, so again, if you're looking at the the charts and you've you've got ten charts in front of you, by being able to connect the career profile to the job search plan to either the job they're in or just what jobs they're looking for, you should be able to arrive at percentages fairly easily. Um, and you know, if if they get um, eight eight out of ten charts that look great, and they have an eighty percent, and they get a four, uh, and they say, well, yeah, but that's not what we do. We we do exactly what you guys are saying we should do. I mean, you kind of have to point back to the charts. And say, okay, well, you know, maybe I didn't see it, but. Here, here's what I see is that in the career profile, Jane wants to be a receptionist and now Jane's working at a grocery store. So help me understand, you know, it's not in the doc, it's not documented in the record. So if I missed it, point it out to me. Uh, but if I didn't miss it, you know, you can't tell me, well, I had this conversation in my car on the way back from, you know, wherever that I didn't document where she told me that it's fine. Like that, I can't score that. I can't score, you know. <laughs> What is that in court? That's that's hearsay, right? Where you say somebody else said something. Um, so, uh, you know, you, you just have to be reasonable and rational uh, and uh, people won't have any problems with it. Um, and you've got a good, you're in a good position as a fidelity reviewer because when you say, well, maybe I didn't see it in the chart, they're happy to find it for you in the chart if they know it exists. I, I promise you, they are happy to find it for you. And they know their way through their own charts way better than any of us do, right? So. Um, so that that's the easiest way to kind of deflect any pushback on any scoring that you might share with people is that well maybe I didn't see it um, can you help you know can you help me find it I'm happy to score it if you can help me find it um, and again you know some people absolutely know it's in the record others they're going to say well yeah but that's not what we do and then you say well I didn't see it in the chart and they'll say oh if you didn't see it in the chart maybe we didn't document it so each agency is a little bit different in their response to some of these things. Um, but they're all, they all know you're not trying to pin them down on any of it. Uh, for the next one, um, job development frequency of employer contact. This one's pretty prescriptive. Um, we want to see that each employment specialist makes at least six face-to-face -face employer contacts per week on behalf of clients looking for work. So that's important for you to note right there that it's on behalf of clients. So it can occur with a client or without a client, but it should be on behalf of a client in order for it to count. Um, and what you'll do, like we've done with some other things, you'll rate for each employment specialist and then kind of put the average together and use the closest scale point. Um, it counts even if an employment specialist meets with the same employer more than one time in a week. Uh, like I said, it counts when the client's present, it counts when the client's not present. Um, client specific and generic contacts are included. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And they use a weekly tracking form to document the contacts. So let's start with at the outliers, right? Let's start at a five. What does a five look like? A five would be that they make six or more face-to-face -face employer contacts that are client-specific um, or two employer contacts times the number of people looking for work when there are less than three people looking for work on their caseload. So that helps account for either what I would consider like a new employment specialist who is still kind of building up their caseload or a new program that's still kind of building up IPS services. Um, so for a five, you also need to have that tracking form that's reviewed by the supervisor weekly. The difference between that and a four is a four would be five face-to-face -face employer contacts per week and using the form. Score of three, four face-to-face -face employer contacts and they use the form. And here is a two where it really starts, excuse me, to get different. The employment specialist makes two face-to-face -face employer contacts per week that are client-specific or does not have a process for tracking. 
And we've seen that a few times already in the fidelity scale where if they don't track something, we can only give a certain score and that certainly applies here. Um, job development, um, it's an interesting one. Um, I, I think not everybody loves doing job development. Uh, so that's something you just wanna be aware of as a fidelity reviewer going into an organization. Um, I've had employment specialists, um, I've asked them, you know, is this, is like when we're out on a job development observation, is this your favorite part of the employment program, doing job development, meeting new people, et cetera? And I've had people tell me, yes, I love it. I've had people tell me, no, I hate it. Um, and what's great is even if they don't like it, uh, usually they're pretty darn good at it. Um, so um, I always reframe it with somebody who kind of identifies that it's not their favorite part of the role as, um, you know, it's relationship building and that's exactly what you're doing with your clients. So, you know, your skill set is intact and, and uh, you just have to build the relationship. So if you think about it that way, um, it, it's kind of another way to view it to make it a little bit more pleasant. Um, the next item here, job development, quality of employer contact, um, is exactly what it sounds like. And this is where we go as fidelity reviewers, um, kind of observe them doing job development. I'm gonna flip to this point in the fidelity manual. Um, and that's really a big one. Sometimes with agencies with many, like with three or more employment specialists, reviewers may not get a chance to observe everybody. So you observe as, as many of them as you can, just based on the schedule. Um, I always try to stay on time for these. Often the employment specialists have told the employers, I'll be there at 11 or 11.15. And so the last thing I wanna do as a fidelity reviewer is make the employment specialist late because after I leave, they still have to manage a relationship with the employer. So I always ask, on day one, um, if they could help me stay on, on track time-wise so that we don't show up late to a um, job development meeting with an employer. Not that everybody else is less important than an employer, but um, you know, often, often these hiring managers are you know, busy people who are graciously taking time out of their day to do a job development observation trial for us. So I just wanna make sure we're respecting their time um, you know, to the degree that we can. Um, let's see here. Uh, let's see here. Um, I would love, I always say I'd like to see three things if we, if the schedule will allow it. I'd like to see them on a job development visit with an employer they've established a relationship with, preferably where they have somebody placed. Uh, I'd like to see a job development um, observation with an employer they have yet to place somebody and the relationship is kind of forming. And then if time allows, I'd love to see um, like a cold call, sort of first touch with an employer they have no relationship with. I, we don't always get to go to all three, and depending on where, um, you know, what part of a state you're reviewing. I've done some reviews like in downtown Chicago and travel to and from, from like employer one to employer two to employer three. Um, it's just prohibitive. I mean, it takes, if you're going to get on Lakeshore Drive in Chicago, for example, I mean, you're going to be an hour, even if it's 25 blocks away. Um, so all of that is context that matters on a fidelity review and it's all worth noting and talking through with the team, they'll let you know um, if it's too ambitious. Uh, and sometimes you get in the car and you go and you have the best laid plans and then it just runs along at place number one. And so you don't get to place number three and that's okay. Um, that, you know, you have to be flexible, especially in this one, you have to be flexible. Um, if if it's not possible to observe job development at all, you could score a one. Now, I don't think that counts for COVID, um, for example. Um, that would be, you know, pre-COVID or post-COVID if we ever get to that point in the world, right? Um, uh, Post-COVID, where we're all back face-to-face -face and you show up at an organization and they have no job development scheduled and you say, well, we'd like to see job development. And their response is, oh, I couldn't get anybody to schedule time with me during these two days, so we won't be able to see it. So it's like, okay, well, it's a one. I'm still happy to like kind of role play and watch you do it and give you pointers or give you some feedback on what I see, but I have to score you a one because you're not, you're not showing me um, the relationship building. Uh, the scoring here is fairly self-explanatory. It's what you see. Um, after I come out of every job development observation, I ask the employment specialist, what do you think you did well? Um, did you think there's anything 
that you could have improved. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's, I always tell them it's really weird to have some stranger with you and try to pretend like they're not there and just act like you would normally act if they weren't there. So I encourage them to introduce me as a colleague or they, they are welcome to tell the employer I'm here doing a fidelity review. I always, I tell them usually just say I'm from the state and I'm here to do a fidelity review. Um, and often what's great when they choose to say that to an employer is the employer will look at me and say, you just got to know since you're from the state, how great she does. And she is the best thing, you know, like it's so nice to hear those sort of really um, organic compliments um, from a person who's developed a relationship with them. So um, I try to just be non-intrusive and non-interruptive. I don't ask any questions of the employer. If they talk to me directly, I'll certainly, you know, I'll greet them and say hi, but unless they say something to me directly, I really don't engage in the discussion. Um, and Dawn, can you talk a little bit, and Darren too, if, if you're both still on, um, talk a little bit about how you are doing those job development observations during COVID? Yeah, what what we've been doing, because we, you know, early on, um, you know, I had mentioned that that we decided for a variety of reasons to continue on with Fidelity reviews, and I know Westat's calling them uh, quality assurance feedback or something along that line, but um, what we opted to do was role play, just as you said, and we have the employment specialist um, either uh, do a role play and think of somebody on their caseload specifically and then, um, you know, go to, in, in air quotes, <laughs> that employer um, and and you know to tell us what kind of employer it is so that we can as the, the playing the 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 part of the employer so we can uh, target our answers to what they're saying. And actually, the other thing that we've done is we've said if you have a relationship with an employer and you want to schedule with them so that we can do a phone interview with you and them, we're happy to do that as well. Um, fewer agencies have taken advantage of that, and that's actually probably truer to the model than doing the role play, or it is truer to the model. Um, but it's the other thing that we've said that we will do uh, if somebody sets that up. So that's how we've been handling it at this point in time. Yeah, this Thanks, is Darren. Darren. I would just ask if you focus on to kind of get that sense of employer, you know, relationship that they're talking about, you know, building that relationship, sharing information about what their agency does and how they, you know, ask information from the um, employer. So um, definitely, I think it's one of the most scariest times for an employment specialist. The feedback I've gotten from people is that people get really nervous, but after it, they're quite relieved. So um, yeah. we do really want to empower the, the employment specialist and the team to think up, you know, relationships or contacts. Because usually on, on a review I just did last week, um, I just let them talk about a situation that they had done and that they were comfortable sharing. So um, we really want to put that employment specialist in the driver's seat to make them as comfortable as possible because it is awkward. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. It certainly is. Um, so I, I, and just, I know I have a hand up. So while we're kind of moving towards unmuting, um, I think it's Elma that has the hand up. Um, I'll just kind of share the, technique wise as a fidelity reviewer, I usually spend the car ride to the employer trying to sort of, um, you know, resolve some anxieties and fears about me being present during a job development um, meeting, um, you know, and just being very sort of calm and real with, with the employment specialist so that when they get to the employer, they don't appear sort of like as not themselves. I love, the last thing I want to do is have my presence throw them off their game to the degree that the employer is kind of like, what are you, who are you, what are you doing? Um, so, uh, so yeah. Um, and so I think we have a question there. I don't know if the hand is still raised. Oh, no, not still raised. Uh, looks like everybody's put their hands down and I don't see another question for the moment. Okay, but fair I, enough. I will, you know, and I, I'm going to confirm what Darren said. One of the things that we try and do, and, and I guess we haven't talked as, um, you know, we've talked about some related to being a reviewer is that um, I'm sure in Illinois and also in the state of Washington, we work really, really, really hard at letting agencies know it's not an audit. Yep. That there's, in, in the case of Washington State, there's no um, loss of money. Uh, you know, your rate of pay is not attached to your fidelity review score. 
Um, it really, we, so we go in and try and be as friendly, open, helpful, pleasant as we can possibly be, and including in the job development role play, because it is nerve wracking for, for job developers. I think they feel like a lot of the review was kind of resting on their shoulders. When in fact, the review is really an agency wide thing. And I think some agencies don't understand that. So yeah. we work also really hard at trying to uh, make clear that leadership has a big piece in this. Your supervisor has a big piece in this. The job developer has a big piece in this. And and just try and set the stage for, for agencies being as um, comfortable and forthcoming as they can possibly be. Yep. And and I usually tell people, too, that anecdotally, I've never been on a fidelity review where the job development was was bad. It's always been good. And it doesn't mean there's not, you know, elements for feedback or, or whatever. Um, but, you know, by the time the fidelity reviewers come around, that employment specialist has had to learn that in, in their training, right? They've had to learn how to do job development in the training. They've had to have their supervisor, you know, observe them. Um, you know, et cetera. Uh, and, and I just, I just don't think I've ever experienced somebody that just was, you know, terrible at job development because I don't think you last. And, and like, if you're not good at it, either you don't get hired into the position or you don't, you move into another position in the organization. Um, so I, I just, I can't, I can't imagine what would have to occur in order for me to see somebody who's, you know, terrible at job development. I mean, at a minimum, I would think they'd call in sick for the two days of the fidelity review, <laughs> not to be, you know, crude, but, um, you know, that's the only thing Don't I could think of to avoid it, is just be evasive, you know, I, I've never seen anybody yeah, that's bad I agree at it. With <laughs> I've never seen anybody that's bad at it. I've, like I said, I've seen people that, you know, they, they, uh, they knew where they were, you know, needed some work, but it wasn't, it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad at all. It just... Uh, just they just needed some practice more than anything. So, um, so if you're out there and you're thinking, gosh, I don't want to go on a fidelity review where, um, you know, I have to tell somebody they stink at it. Like I, I don't think that'll ever happen to you. Just to be real honest with you, I don't, I don't think that's anything to be worried about. Um, I've got uh, four after the hour. Um, what, what does everybody think about taking a about a eight to ten minute break and then kind of getting back in? We're just at kind of on the last legs of this. Um, Fidelity scale and fidelity manual, and we can get into then sort of the fidelity review process. Um, so maybe we take about an eight to 10 minute break and I'll put it on mute for me. Um, but if people have questions, like always, please enter them into the chat and um, we will get to those um, on the other side of the break. And I will talk to you in a few minutes.
Okay, I'm back on everybody. Let's see, we do have a question too. I'll wait for a few minutes here and uh, then we can answer that one, okay. Okay, everybody. Um, Dawn, I didn't pay attention to the clock. How are we on time? Are we about 10 minutes, eight to 10 minutes from our break? I want to make sure people are back. I think, um, yeah, I think we're good. Yeah, I think we are. Okay. I, I didn't want to get so too far into it. Yeah, I didn't pay attention either. I just came back and I've been sitting here. <laughs> yeah, well, it's Sorry. funny because I had my my daughter in the background, so I'm working virtually today. And anybody out there who is a parent will uh, hopefully appreciate this. And it was uh, eight to ten minutes of just crisis management because my daughter had misplaced her cell phone, and we had to go all around the house to try to find it. So, um, <laughs> for a 13 year old, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. I don't want to minimize it. Um, so I I just kind of <laughs> got up and went on search mode. So yeah. um, hopefully we, successfully. Successfully, yes. I actually have a little app on my phone. Um, it's a family link type app that I can use my phone to play a sound on her phone. So we, the problem we had is we had to go all around the house and try to triangulate the sound we were hearing. So <laughs> um, like name too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's so that's exciting. How my, that's how exciting my life is in case anybody's wondering. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, we did have a question. All... <laughs> yeah. Um, we did have a question. Would a Zoom call be equal to a face-to-face -face contact with an employer from Gene? And, you know, that's a great question, Gene. And I think pre-COVID, I, I would imagine we would probably hesitated to count that. But I think now um, I'm certainly willing to count that as a face-to-face -face session. Um, in the current, you know, sort of state of things, and I would, I would bet that after COVID has kind of, I don't. First of all, I don't, I don't want to get too far off topic, but I don't know that COVID will ever really go away. I think it's something we're kind of going to learn to live with and adapt to living with, um, right. even with vaccines. So my hunch is that a lot of different industries, like ours, have learned how to also include virtual. Um, sort of techniques into what we do. And so I think when all is said and done, even if COVID is in our rearview mirror, our our ability to do virtual meetings, virtual appointments with clients, virtual appointments with employers will still remain. And it'll be a, an option, just like you used to have only a phone-in option for a meeting if you couldn't attend. I think we'll also have a virtual option. Uh, so um, my hunch is uh, it counts right now today. I'd certainly entertain it on a fidelity review today. Um, it makes a lot of sense. And then, you know, going forward, if, you know, three years from now, I mean, may, that may be part of an efficiency we've learned that fidelity reviews, instead of paying for the travel for, you know, four people to go someplace for two days, we're going to pay for two people to go and have two people do the interviews virtually or, or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, and those I are all the things. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. 
one of the things that's that that I hear is is at least being considered in, in Washington State is um, even after COVID to continue having telehealth be an option as far as meeting with folks. So you're right, yeah. there, things are gonna be different when we're done. I yep. will say that the state of Washington as a whole is in phase two and what that means is there's limited ability to go out in the community. Um, and I, so regardless of what the fidelity scale says now or then or whatever, what I would say is the best way to build relationships is still face to face. So make sure to include that when you're able in your repertoire of what you're doing with employers, um, online job applications with no contact with the employer other than that's never going to be considered relationship building. It's just not. So I want to make that clear too. Yeah. Um, Agreed. Zoom. Yeah. That's relationship building face to face, even better. Um, and it really is about building relationships with the employers. So that's my editorial. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think it's helped us really view uh, like efficiency in a different way. Um, it used to be yeah. that, um, you know, you couldn't be someplace because you couldn't travel to get there, you know, at a specific time. But now, all of a sudden now, here I am today doing this training, right? And I'm sitting in Illinois and you all are all sitting in Washington. And I think, again, two years ago, Don, if I would have said to you, hey, I'll do a training virtually, I think you would have said, no, probably not, you won't. <laughs> um, <laughs> we didn't think it would have worked, but here we are. We all figured it out. Um, we, we have all learned that we have a level of resilience that um, maybe we didn't give ourselves credit for before, right? Uh, we left off at number eight, diversity of job types. Uh, so we've got a couple different diversity calculations here. And I do want to, you know, make sure that folks have a level of understanding with these. So diversity of job types is all about making sure that we're not sort of funneling our clients all into the same type of job. So I used dishwasher earlier, so I'll use it again. So if you go to an organization and they have 100 people employed, but all 100 of them are dishwashers, there's no diversity in job type, right? Um, and so we want to make sure we are paying attention to preferences. We want to make sure we're paying attention to their needs and all the things that make them individuals and, and great applicants for the jobs they want. Um, so what we'll get from an organization on the front end is we'll get a list of um, competitive jobs for people who are currently employed. And um, they've got some clauses here. If there are fewer than 10 jobs, here's what you ask for, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the way you're going to play it is on that list, if a job is represented twice, that's fine. Once they list a job type the third time, you don't count the third or anything after that of that same job type. So the examples are the best way to understand this one. Um, so let me get out my new fancy pen that I decided all of a sudden today I'm going to start using. Um, so you got 10 people employed in the following positions. So the ones that stick out as duplicated are dishwasher and dishwasher, right? But remember, two times is fine, three three or more is not fine. So what we're going to have is you, as you see below here, uh, since the dishwasher is listed only twice, reviewers count it two times, but the stocker is listed three times. So what you'll do is you see here, they just put a line through there. You don't have to physically put a line through a list or anything like that, but you don't count that third one. Uh, and so what ends up happening is You've got nine jobs if you don't count that third stocker. Nine divided by 10 equals 0.9 or 90%. And if you walk it over to the rubric here for diversity of job types, you'll see it's another with percentage ranges. So the five is 85 to 100% of diversity of job type. Um, and you can walk it backwards from there. If you do the math and you get 64%, then they'd have a score of a three um, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's diversity of job types. Uh, and it's different from the next one, which is diversity of employers. But diversity of employers is very, very similar to the board. So in the same way I said, if you have 100 people employed and they're all dishwashers, there's no diversity of job type. If you have 100 people employed and there are 100 different job types, but it's all one Walmart store, that wouldn't be very good diversity of employers. So um, this is where they're also going to provide you, in addition to the list of um, job types, they're gonna give you a list of businesses where people are working. 
And it's the same. When an employer is listed twice, you count it twice. When the employer is listed three or more times, um, really what you want to start doing is asking about different store locations. Even though it's the same employer, I like to ask clarifying questions about, is it the same hiring manager? Um, often, where it gets sort of tricky is grocery stores are good at this. They'll have two or three locations in a metropolitan area, right? Same store, same company. And some chains, each store kind of has a level of autonomy where they have their own HR department, their own sort of hiring manager, their own store manager, their own produce manager, all of that stuff. But other grocery chains I've noticed sort of have a more regional approach where within a, let's say a certain zip code, all of those positions in those, let's say three stores are, they all funnel up to the same hiring manager. And so it really starts to be a discussion then if uh, the examples are the best way to look at it on this one too. Um, on this one, 12 people are employed at the businesses listed below. And you've got a nice comprehensive list, right? Vroom, vroom, auto repair and um, so on and so forth. The senior center though, listed twice. And remember, two is okay. Um, Happy Burgers though is listed three times. So you're not going to count the third Happy Burgers. 12 total employers, 11 diverse employers, because you've crossed off one Happy Burgers, that equals 0.91 or 91%. And if you walk over to the rubric again, 85 to 100% of the time gives them a five. Uh, so it's it's easy. You just got to kind of think about how what you're seeing equates to sort of the real world. So like Happy Burgers, mm -hmm. they crossed off the third one, for example. But, you know, if Happy Burgers has three store locations and there are three different cities and um, even if they have the same hiring manager, this is where your review team really can help you out because you're going to want to kind of debate this back and forth. So do you count the third one if it's three different cities, even if it's the same hiring manager? Um, and, you know, you're going to kind of bat back and forth. Well, is, you know, let, I don't know, let's think that through. Um, is it in the spirit of this item or is it not? And if it was three cities and three hiring managers, I think I'd be very, very comfortable counting all three. But it's all about the conversational sort of context to it, really. And I don't know if, Dawn, Darren, you've seen anything sort of similar that's Washington-specific. Grocery stores seems to come up quite a bit. Um, and sometimes chain, uh, especially restaurants, like if there's several McDonald's in the area or something like that. Well, and I've got a, yeah, this... a real life example from when I worked in an agency. Um, most of Lake is small. You know, we've got like 22,000 people. Um, there is one Safeway. We had several jobs at Safeway. In all different departments. There were no two people that worked in the same department. Um, when we had our fidelity review, we got counted down related to diversity of, of employer, but we ended up with a high score related to diversity of job. Sure. Of course, we tried to fight that, and you can't. <laughs> <It is laughs> you're, you're not wrong for trying. <laughs> so that's that's my real life example. Dan, yeah, one example I have. From being in uh, King County, definitely we had a strong working relationship with some uh, providers uh, with uh, Amazon. So that was one where, you know, there was a lot of distribution warehouse type positions with one employer. Yep. And we even have a question from Harrison. He says, I think this is one of the hardest part about this is the clients that I have. There's a majority that are trying to pursue jobs through Walmart, Safeway, and Goodwill with some various positions of interest. Uh, how would you take that into consideration when doing a fidelity review, especially when these are the jobs the clients want to pursue? I always tell providers, listen, if the client tells you I want to go work at Safeway, you're never wrong for helping them get a job at Safeway. I don't care what the fidelity scale says about your diversity of employer. If the client says they want to work there, who are we to say they shouldn't, right? That's the reality. Um, and, and that's the same approach I take in the fidelity review process in general. If the client's telling you something that is in contrast to a fidelity scale item, as long as you've got it documented, I'm still going to have to score you the way I have to score you, but it's, it's not wrong. You're doing exactly what the client wants. Right. From the standpoint yeah. of, of, you know, working with the, the individual, the other thing I would do in that case, and the other thing I did do, because I had folks that would say, I'm only going to work at Walmart, period. And my conversation was, you may have to wait a long time before you get a job opening that they accept you for if they do. Yeah. What about Walmart like? What's so attractive about Walmart? Let's see if that occurs in some other places that you might consider too. Sure. And so I would do a live conversation with the person 
I tried to broaden the horizon by saying, what do you like about it? How can we see if we can find other places that fit that too? Yeah, so that's a good way that, to do it. That stuff. That's a really good way to do it. Really, I think where it gets sticky is for a rural provider or a provider that provides services in a rural area. Often the number of employers is slim, right? Um, and so you're kind of left with a few big ones that are available. And, and I've seen like Walmart is, is the major employer for kind of a, an area because they're the largest employer in the area. And it, again, it kind of goes back to your review team and how much banter you have back and forth about what do you count and what don't you. Um, and sometimes, like we've heard already just through some of these examples, sometimes the organization is not wrong, but the fidelity review just doesn't have a flexibility for it. Um, and, and that's, nobody has to like it, but, um, you know, the fidelity reviewers are kind of stuck with what, what they have in front of them via the fidelity scale and the providers are kind of stuck with what is available as far as employers go and what the clients are telling them. So sometimes that's an area where there just isn't a lot of overlap in certain situations. And I, I always tell providers, just like I said on this call, you know, you're not wrong at all. I know the fidelity scale has a score a certain way. Um, so you're not wrong, but the score is the score. And then the other part of it too, I guess that I'd put out there is, I think that's why the fidelity scale wants you to rate many, you know, 10 or more jobs for diversity because it, it helps anyway offset some of the uh, these these uh, exceptions if you want to think about it um you know the idea i think is they can't I, i'm sure they don't have a real good concrete rule for do this in rural areas or do this when the client says they want to do this um so in the absence of all of those asterisks they would have to put in the fidelity manual it's kind of like let's just try to get as many in there as possible um so I don't know. Um, it, it's um, it's never a problem that is a huge problem. It's you know it's not the, like the difference between a one and a five for most organizations. Uh, usually for organizations, it's the difference between like um, a five and a four or a four and a three. Um, and so you know you can only do what you can do. I guess is what I'd tell you as a provider and as a reviewer. You're also kind of in that same boat. You can only do what you can do. Um, competitive jobs is the next one. It's number 10 here. Um, and by the way, there are great examples in the Fidelity Review Manual of these diversity items. If you want to look at a couple more examples, um, this Fidelity Review Manual has got them laid out in crystal clear format, um, show you exactly how you'd play it for certain ones. Um, and, and then the reality too is until you get on a Fidelity Review and you kind of see it in front of you, um, it, it's it's easy to conceptualize, and then when you get a real example in front of you on a fidelity review, you know all those tricky little elements that we're talking about. Again, that's where you want to tap the shoulders of your co-reviewers and kind of say, hey, you know, like take a look at this. What do you think? What should we count? I asked the employment specialist, and they said it's different hiring managers. They're in different cities or different zip codes or whatever. Um, so how do we how do we regard that and kind of stand behind it in the confines of the fidelity manual? Uh, for competitive jobs, this is exactly what it sounds like. We're looking to see that the jobs people are in pay at least minimum wage. Uh, they're open market jobs. They're not set-asides. Um, seasonal jobs, it should be noted, um, or temp jobs uh, certainly count as competitive jobs. Um, and I know a lot of agencies utilize those. Um, we've had people that we've seen who are, uh, they're like seasonal effectively for H&R Block or like lawn care in the spring, you know, a lot of big ramp up on fertilizing and all of that stuff. Um, we've seen even some seasonal stuff in the winters here uh, as snow removal crews really start to staff up for the, the bad weather. Um, and so that all counts um, for sure. In the same way, we're going to get a list. Uh, we've got the list of people who are working, right? We've got job types and businesses. Um, and so really what we're going to try to identify is um, are these minimum wage at least jobs? Um, are they competitive jobs? And we're going to talk with the team about if they say it's a competitive job, you know, how do they, how do they 
uh, know it's competitive? Like, what are their factors that lead them to believe it's competitive? And they're ideally they're saying all of the things that we talked about just a few seconds ago that it's open labor market, it's not a set aside, it's at least minimum wage, et cetera, et cetera. Often you can tell that just by the wage that people are earning. Um, there aren't many set asides that are minimum wage and up. There are some, um, you know, so it's worth asking the questions. But um, oftentimes the set asides that I've seen pay less than minimum wage um, or or right at minimum wage, not a penny above. Um, and so those are kind of flags that I have. Worth noting here is that if someone is self-employed, that's that counts as competitive employment. You don't see it a lot. At least I don't see it a lot. Um, I have seen it, though. Um, I anecdotally can think of a client who opened up their own um, like house cleaning business. And if you're familiar with, I'm sure they have them in your area. Um, around here they're called Merry Maids and they have all these yellow station wagons with their logo on it. And basically it's it's almost like um it's like a school bus driver goes to the school bus yard and gets the school bus and checks it out and goes and picks up the kid. Like the same sort of thing where, you know, a team leader or somebody goes and picks up a yellow station wagon and goes and picks up maids from their house and drives them to the house they're cleaning that day and then picks them up. And this lady opened up um, her own business doing that and she's got a fleet of cars and um, she's doing really well for herself. It's a great, great story, um, but it's competitive employment. Um, she reports her income. It's it's a business. She files taxes on the business. She's got an accountant. I mean, it is on the up and up. It is a legit business. Another thing that's worth noting, because I know um, in Washington, um, you guys utilize peers pretty well. Um, peer specialist positions are competitive positions. Um, and I think one of the tricky parts here is that, you know, if you if you wanted to argue it, you could argue that peers are a set aside position. Um, but the other side to that argument is it's actually a qualification for the position. Um, so uh, and it pays at least minimum wage and, you know, all the other conditions are met as well. The challenge I would I think most organizations have when when hiring people as peers, like if they hire the person themselves in their own organization, if you go into a fidelity review and an organization gives you 10 people that are employed and four of them are employed in-house as peers, numbers wise, it's gonna throw off some of those diversity figures and so on and so forth. And so um, that might be another situation where you're just telling them that the fidelity scale is the fidelity scale, um, you know, while it's great that you have people hired and they're filling a need in your organization, um, you know, you really may want to consider, this would be your recommendation, you really may want to consider what other types of jobs peers can get in this area instead of just at your your agency. Um, and that that's a tricky conversation to have. I've had that conversation with an organization um, because as a fidelity reviewer, I kind of felt like I was talking out of both sides of my mouth, just to be real honest with everybody, um, you know, that it is great that they're hiring peers, but I can't give you credit for all of it. Um, <laughs> so um, there's there's nothing else to say on that one other than, you know, again, you got to lean back on your fidelity review team. And then when you have questions, you got to ask them of the IPS team and help have them help you understand all of the things that happen behind the scenes for some of these some of these nuances. Uh, number 11 hey, here. And, yeah, go ahead, Darren. I just want to say thanks for going into some detail because those are some of the discussions and challenges that we face. I just want to thank you for kind of going into that and using some of those examples because at the end of the day, we're here to get people jobs and we want to do that client-centered focus. And that's the most you know important driver of the system. The fidelity is really important, but we really want to see people in jobs that they want. So yeah. uh, I just want to Thanks for the extra detail. Well, you're absolutely welcome. And you know, almost every Fidelity review, I end up sort of having a discussion with somebody on the IPS team about how, and it's usually the IPS supervisor, the Fidelity scale is well-intentioned and it's you know backed with evidence. And I, I end up having that conversation with them that I talked about yesterday where, where I describe, you know, once you're in the Fidelity range, you're in the Fidelity range. Having one extra point isn't better Fidelity, it's just Fidelity. Um, it, it, so each organization, I encourage each organization to create a fidelity action plan wherein they make decisions about which items they want to move the number on. 
there may be um, there may be circumstances that exist for an organization where they look at, let's say, a score of a three or a four, and they say, you know what, we're comfortable where that's at because of these other things that have, you know, we have to do or that exist for us. So maybe they've got another sort of um, part of their mission that is they want to create an entirely peer workforce. Um, that's great. That's an awesome mission. I would never say that's wrong. They just need to understand that if that if they want to go all in on that it could impact their fidelity score. And if they're okay with that, I got no qualms. I'll give them a three or whatever the score is um, and just kind of right. explain it. And and they, they're they okay with it. And that's why I said, you know, yesterday, the fidelity reviews aren't contentious. People don't, people don't object in a way that is, you know, like throwing stuff at you or, you know, like you don't have to wear, you know, you don't have to wear chain mail to fidelity reviews. Everybody's understanding and gracious. <laughs> you got to remember they have copies of this stuff too. You know, they have copies of the Fidelity Scale. They have copies of the Fidelity Manual. They've been to some training with Dawn or Darren or Paul before. They've heard us say all these things. So when you show up there and you're just looking at their program and you say, gosh, I see you've got four peers hired out of 10, out of 10 people that are employed, they're going to say, yeah, well, you know, our organization thinks it's important to hire peers. And our employment team, when we find people that are suitable for the peer role, we'd be silly not to encourage them to apply. And they're right. Um, and so you yeah. just say, oh, one okay, the, one thanks. The, one other thing I want to mention there, though, and, and I, I, you've heard me say it before, fidelity is fidelity, and each agency deals with that and their contract with Group and potentially other contracts and, you know, whatever, Medicaid and whatever else they, they deal with. Um, and in a fidelity review, we don't comment on those other things. But yeah. this is just a kind of a, a caveat to the if an agency hires, you know, folks off their caseload kind of a thing. Sometimes contracts, and I'm going to be very honest, I don't remember what the American Group contract says. Sometimes contracts say you can't do that. And and so don't take the, you know, um, hire four people off your caseload into to jobs as that's okay to do it. Within a fidelity model that's potentially fine um, except you're going to get counted down on diversity of employers and, and diversity of jobs um, but the other issue is look at the whole picture look at also your contract and what it says related to whether you can hire individuals from your caseload and because it, it, sometimes it, it, it there are um, sort of discriminatory, discriminatory prohibitions in the contracts but it sure. is what it is so yep. just be aware that's of that big picture. that's I a good point Tom picture. That's a very good point. Um, and I guess the la the last thing I'll kind of throw on the pile with this one is every item in the fidelity scale, the organization has the ability to do what they want to do with. Um, and, and all they need to understand is that they can do whatever they want to do. We're not there to give them permission or say you can or you can't. All they need to understand is choices they make regarding fidelity items will impact their score. So they could choose, for example, to have no IPS supervisor for their team. They could have, you know, no supervision for their IPS employment specialists. And I'm not there to say it's good or bad. I'm just there to say, well, I'm not going to be able to score you on your IPS supervision then, period. And, you know, nine out of 10 agencies are going to say, oh, okay, fine. Um, and, and part of the thing too, you know, you've heard us spend a day and a half telling you our fidelity reviews are non-punitive. There's no financial penalty. There's no et cetera, et cetera. But that's exactly why some agencies decide to make fidelity to this model be the flexible part of their operations, because there's not a financial penalty if they flex it a little bit. Whereas some other contracts, like Dawn talked about, do not allow them the flexibility that fidelity does. So um, we're not there to judge. We're there to help them be the best IPS provider they can be. And every agency is different. They'll have a lot of common ground and a lot of things set up similarly, but at the end of the day, they all create IPS in the way that they have to create it in order for it to work within their agency. Um, and so that's the whole thing we do is we go in and we just understand what that means and compare it to the fidelity scale. There are agencies I've been to that have one employment specialist because that's all they can afford. And so they get marked down on uh, the IPS team element because the team consists of two employment specialists and a supervisor. Well, you don't have a team if you have one employment specialist, right? Um, and when I tell them that in a fidelity review, you know what they say? 
you can recommend that all you want as long as you recommend it with a blank check so I can hire a second employment specialist. <laughs> <laughs> and we all chuckle. And, you know, it's kind of like, I know, I, you know, I don't bring any money with me. I don't have a suitcase with any dollar bills in it. I'm sorry. Um, so everybody's gracious. They know the rules. Um, you know, you got to trust that they're an agency that knows what they're doing. Um, and really, you're just there to understand how they have implemented IPS in comparison to the, the scale. Uh, more than anything. You're not there to judge it or say it's good or bad. Your recommendations are going to be recommendations um, that they probably already know. And so therefore, it's not a surprise. So therefore, you know, nobody gets gets ugly, you know, at the end of the second day or anything like that. Um, Harrison mm -hmm. asks, uh, we have options for janitorial positions within our agency that sometimes our clients could work. Will that affect fidelity negatively? And my favorite two words to answer questions are, it depends. Um, <laughs> so it depends if those are open labor market positions that anybody could fill. It depends if um, you have a client who has an interest in that and it's posted and they apply, do they get some sort of preferential fast track into the position over a candidate from the general public? Um, it depends if you have 10 people employed and nine of them are working in these janitorial positions in your agency. Uh, I mean, there's so many different factors, Harrison, it's tough for me to answer directly, but it could, would be uh, probably the best way I could articulate that. I'd encourage you to look at diversity of job types, diversity of employers, um, competitive employment, oh, what else, um, client preferences. Zero, zero exclusion is actually one, if you if you yep. require that it starts out in that job. Zero mm -hmm. exclusion related to that. Yep. I mean, there's a lot of things in the scale that you could look at to gauge whether or not what the, the practices you're doing would have an impact um, negatively, you know, with fidelity. Um, so without more information, and I'm not saying you should produce more information uh, in this sort of format, um, and you're very welcome. Um, there's just a lot to consider. And that's, the, you know, again, we talked yesterday about the interplay between fidelity items, and that's part of the challenge when you look at a thing in an organization is it's not just one item that it, it could possibly impact. It's multiple items that it has the potential to impact. Um, you know, so that's why I've said, I think you heard me say yesterday, um, you know, the quality of an IPS program is pretty much equal to the quality of the IPS supervision of that program. And part of that is because the IPS supervisor is responsible for so much tracking and supervision and outcomes monitoring um, and and you know modeling behavior that without it or without high quality IPS supervision, the employment specialists um, I think tend to struggle uh, and the score on the fidelity scale tends to struggle too. If you take out IPS supervision from the fidelity score, you're taking a big chunk of points out. And I think uh, don't quote me on this, but I think it's like 14 or maybe it's 15 or so points that you could possibly miss out on without IPS supervision. Uh, so on a total of, you know, 125, even if you, you know, get perfect scores on everything else, you're still at 115, well, 110, um, which, you know, it's not, it's not a bad score at all. It's just um, the chances of you being perfect on all the other elements without the supervisor are prob probably not great either. So, um, it's just important, all of it's important. That's the tough part, I think, is all of it counts. For individualized follow-along supports number 11, um, did I, yeah, uh, no, I didn't scroll to it, sorry. Sorry if I'm making anybody dizzy as I scroll through this. Um, if there's a survey, you can put that in the survey and Dawn and Darren will tell me not to do that in the future. Um, <laughs> um, so this is clients receive different types of support for working for a job that are based on the job, the preferences, the history, the needs. Um, it's not all on the IPS team. We want to try to rely on natural resources when we can, which could be other treatment team members, family, friends, coworkers, um, and the employment specialist. If um, the client requests, we can provide support, you know, to the employer. Um, and offer, we offer help with uh, career development, assistance with education, a more desirable job, more preferred job duties, et cetera. Um, and a lot of this is going to be, um, this is another one where to get a five, it's the same thing as the definition basically. So if you do all this, you'll get a five. It's just reiterated over here. Um, 
to move from a five to a four, um, clients receive different types of support. You know, basically the first clause, um, and we provide employer supports. And really what's missing in the score of four is that there's no evidence that we help people move on to more preferable jobs. Um, there's no sort of um, enhanced support uh, by tr treatment team members. And if you walk that down to a three, it's a more narrow range of support that we provide, and it's primarily on the shoulders of the employment specialist. So um, sort of a more comprehensive look to a score of five, a little bit less comprehensive in terms of function by four, and certainly three is the start of less comprehensive in terms of who provides the support. Uh, so it's good to kind of um, kind of titrate some of this down as you're thinking about it when you're hearing these things in interviews. Um, let's see here. And, and really, um, the possible sources of information, this is going to be uh, client interviews. Um, ideally, in the, in the unit meeting for the IPS team, team meeting, unit meeting, they're talking about so and so is employed. I'm worried, um, you know, because they're not waking up on time. You know, what are things we can do to help support them? You know, can we help them get a shift that starts even a little bit later? Can we help? Um, do, are there funds available for us to help them um, get an alarm clock? Do they, can we show them how to set an alarm clock on their phone? Who's good? Their therapist that they see is really awesome with tech stuff. We're going to have them do that at their next appointment. Those would be the kind of things, you know, you're listening for in a in a team meeting. Um, certainly if you're talking with any family members, um, that would be, you know, that's a natural support, right? Um, especially if they're living in the same home as the family member. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any, I don't think there's any one-off clauses here, uh, in this item. Rides to work is a big one here. A lot of problem solving regarding how people are getting to and from work. <clears throat> um, uh, you might also see if somebody's open to a therapist, for example, um, you might also see the IPS team either talking in the meeting or talking with um, the therapy staff about how um, at the next session can you review some sort of in the moment coping skills that they can use on the job when they're starting to get anxious on the job so they don't have to go on break or you know that sort of thing. So those are very specific examples um, that I could point out. There's some other examples in here. Um, ideally, you've got a job support plan where all of this is located that you could just go look at. <clears throat> Not every organization uses job support plans. Um, and so this one here, um, uh, if the plan is not updated to include factors related to the position and the person's current situation when the person is offered a job, reviewers do not score higher than a three. Um, so, yep, up here, that's where I missed it. Written job uh, support plans are required for scores of four or five. Um, and again, there are places, sometimes it gets confusing to look at some of these documents that people create. So there are agencies I've seen where they have a job search plan that really doubles as a job support plan. It's got all of the information of both documents on it. And they don't, the agency I'm thinking of in particular didn't even call it a job search plan or a job support plan. They had some other name for it. Um, so, you know, going in and looking for a job search plan, I couldn't find it, had to ask for help. And they said, oh, well, this is what we use. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, well, it's all there, good. Um, they pulled a, a switcheroo on me. Um, and really, what it comes down to on this one, like some other things, is you really want to make sure it's individualized. If they provide the same exact support to all workers, uh, that's not very individualized. Um, so you want to make sure that, um, you know, if somebody, if they've got identified in the chart that somebody is not good in social settings, and then you've got them, you know, working in a social setting, there, there should be um, a support plan and ad adequate documentation that would tell you why they're working in that setting, even though it's sort of contraindicated. Um, so those are good questions for a surveyor, for I shouldn't say surveyor, for a reviewer to ask. Uh, those are very good questions to ask. The next one here is time unlimited follow along supports. Uh, this one is kind of all chart review um, and it's very prescriptive. You're gonna go in and you're gonna look for exactly this stuff. Face-to-face -face contact with a client within one week before starting a job, within three days after starting a job, weekly for the first month, and at least monthly for a year or more on average. Um, and that has got some 
caveats after working steadily as desired by clients or as tolerated by clients, I'd even say. Um, it's not uncommon for you to see that clients told us they don't need it or you see documentation that the client is okay not, not having it. Um, <clears throat> additionally, um, the employment specialist would contact somebody within three days of learning about the job. And so what you're gonna do is just kind of, as you're doing your chart reviews, make note of these, um, these sort of milestones in the chart. Um, this is another one where a score of five corresponds to what the definition is. The score of four then, uh, they have face-to-face -face contact with working clients weekly for the first month after starting a job and at least monthly for a year or more. So that means they missed face-to-face -face contact within one week, within three days after starting a job. Um, and if you go down to three, um, it's the duration. It's not really time unlimited because it's at least four months after starting a job. Um, and that's at least half. Really Go ahead. Is that the chart review form that we use actually has those right on it. So it'll say, um, it'll have a box that says give dates within three three uh, days of starting a job, give dates yep. uh, weekly for the month. And, and so it's just a nice and tidy way you don't have to remember the standard. It's written right there for you, and you just write out the dates, and we go back and look at the chart review forms and say yes or no, they or not. Yeah, that one, there's really no shortcut on this one. You just got to go look through the charts and, and find the information. Um, you know, and really, the only miss on this is either if the organizations aren't providing that function or if they're not documenting it. And if they're doing it but not documenting it, the recommendation is simple. It's that they need to kind of improve their documentation surrounding time unlimited follow around, follow along supports. And if they're not doing it, then the recommendation is it's recommended that employee specialists have face-to-face -face contact within one week before starting a job, within three days after starting a job. Um, and you know, there may be circumstances to that, right? There may be, um, you know, there may be sort of other tasks that the organization has them doing that prevents them from doing this. And that's where you can, instead of saying don't have them do that, you can kind of just make the recommendation that they um, make employment specialists available during these employment milestones. Whatever that means for the organization is for them to figure out, but. I wanted to take just a second um, to and see and and just point out, do you see the, the things that say in the middle, uh, DOC, oh. OBS, IT, ISP, um, those actually tell you where you're going to find your answers. Yep. Um, documentation, interview, observation. Um, okay, remind me what ISP is, Paul. I'm, I'm going to cheat and, and go to the back. Yeah, They've got the data sources right here on the last page. Yeah. And so that, that kind of helps, too, as you're getting ready to do some of the review pieces. Um, you know, when you see on the, the fidelity item, here's the things you have to look at to score this or can look at to score this. Um, it makes it a little easier to know that you're not just relying on an interview or you're not just relying on the document review. It's some combination of the two or more. So, yep. Just wanted to mention that. Nope, I found good. it helpful. Hopefully somebody it, will too. <laughs> you know, I, I'm embarrassed to say how late I found that out into the game of fidelity reviewing. So it's a good thing that you brought it up because I don't, it's on the last page. So I don't think I ever flipped that far back, you know, in the yeah, fidelity no, scale. Yeah, no, did too so um, <laughs> you're in good company <laughs> yeah that's a good good call out um community-based services uh, is exactly what it sounds like right and this is another one where we're going to rate each employment specialist based on their total weekly scheduled hours off-site um, and then calculate the average <clears throat> now the one of the challenges here is if organizations don't have a real good accounting of their time. So some organizations who are really uh, what I call like sophisticated with data can run a report that shows you all of their activities that are offsite. So what I'll tell you is pre-COVID, all job development was offsite, right? Now, if we're doing a virtual appointment with a hiring manager, I have yet to see direction on how do I regard that? Is that on-site or is that off-site? Um, because unless the employee is, unless the, I should say, employment specialist is out in the community on their computer having the Zoom meeting, um, you know, if they're at the office or even at their home, let's say, I don't know if I would consider that offsite or not. I know from a billing perspective, if I'm doing 
a telehealth appointment, um, I don't get to count telehealth appointments as offsite. So, so it's really worth discussing if you see that to a great degree in a fidelity review. I don't know what the right answer is. I always think in my head, a tie goes to the provider, right? When, I, when there's no direction that is that I can find, I want to try to give credit at all, if at all possible, to the provider who's doing the work. Um, but I'll just put that out there as something that I think COVID really starts to throw a question mark into. Um, yeah. But pre-COVID, jo job development, counted right because it's all out there it's all out with hiring managers you could look at job development logs and kind of you know even if you roughly quantify i looked at dawn's job development logs and it looks like she's doing six a week and it looks like they take about you know her she spends about three hours of her day doing it um every day so you know you start to do the math on that and you can get it a percentage um all the other stuff that's offsite. So I guess what I was where I was going with that is some organizations have a little bit more sophistication with the data. It can run a report that shows you offsite services only, and you can sort of get a bead on the number of hours that they're doing offsite and kind of do some quick and dirty math. Um, other, t you may have to rely on job development logs. You may have to rely on <clears throat> if you can't find anything else, look at the employee specialist's calendars. If their calendars say you know, offsite, onsite, you know, go to this employer, go to that employer. You could rough into these percentages. I mean, there's certainly a method with how you, you could do it. Um, and like everything else, when in doubt, um, ask a question of your fidelity reviewers, ask a question of the IPS team. And this is one in particular where I, I can tell you, I have said, um, you know, I'm really having trouble scoring this one. Um, the In order for me to score it, it calls for me to arrive at a percentage or a range of a percentage. So can you help me figure out how to arrive at a, a range or a percentage for you and your work on, a, on an average week? <clears throat> and usually, if you kind of say that out loud to the team, they are more than happy to kind of put that together for you um, so that you can see it. The uh, Fidelity Manual um, you know, talks about some things like um, uh, let's see here. Let me get to the right section first. Um, let's see here. <clears throat> it does do a good job in the Fidelity Manual of explaining what exactly is considered offsite. And I know one of the things we've fielded over the years recently is you know, what about when you go to, I'll just say Target, for example, and they say, oh, all of our applications are online, often because of either connectivity or, um, you know, uh, equipment or hardware sort of considerations, the employment specialist then will take the client back to the company office and do the online application there. So what used to be something you might be able to go get an application and fill it out by hand now has become an in-office thing instead of an off-site thing. Um, so we always want to remind employment specialists, you know, you can go to a lot of places and use computers. You can go to a lot of places and soak up free Wi-Fi. Um, it doesn't always have to be at the office. Um, so that's something that's worth kind of bringing up. Um, dang it, I can't find the part um, I was going to mention. Um, here's some good questions for IPS specialists. Um, I, I, what I was going to mention was when you can't find any specific data, you know, really, you can either decide you can't score, you can't adequately arrive at a percentage, um, or you can keep asking them to produce their time. And I've had people literally sit down with their calendar and write on there, this one was on site, this one was off site, this was off site, this was off site, this was off site. And that's okay, it's kind of tedious, it's kind of a pain, but um, at the end of the day, I wanna give them a score if I can give them a score. Um, you know, the last thing I wanna do is walk out and say, you know, I'm gonna score them a one just because they couldn't arrive at a number. I mean, they know when they're off site and when they're on site. Um, so they'll tell you in the interviews, by the way, too, um, if you ask, you know, how much are you offsite, they might say 85% of the time. And I don't want to go so far as to say don't trust it, but, you know, like we've done with a couple other things, kind of verify it if you can with another source of data. Um, it, it just, everybody in an interview tends to tell me that 
you know, more than 75% of the time they're offsite. And I think that it feels that way, but the reality, you know, is usually a little bit less than that, which is why the threshold for five uh, is set at 65% here. Um, and the last one, yay, the last one, um, assertive engagement and outreach by an integrated treatment team is exactly what it sounds like. It's another where to get a five, you just meet the level, the threshold of the definition, um, but basically that we're not terminating services based on missed appointments or some sort of fixed time limit. We're systematically documenting outreach. We're engaging, uh, doing engagement and outreach multiple times with integrated team members uh, when we can. We have multiple home and community visits and we coordinate visits uh, with the team members and the family uh, when, ap when applicable. This is another one that titrates down. Um, if you don't have all six strategies, can we meet five? No, we can't meet five, can we meet four? Um, and that corresponds to the score. So pretty um, self-explanatory here uh, on this one, nothing to, um, nothing that sticks out as like a tricky part of it. Um, part of what you'll do is you'll wanna look at records for people who are no longer open to the IPS program just to kind of verify some of this. <clears throat> um, and you'll talk to people in interviews about how they re-engage or try to keep people engaged. Um, you know, as services go on. And, you know, like always, some good examples here in the fidelity scale or fidelity manual. Um, <clears throat> so I am, let me do this. Uh, I've got about four after the hour. I'm gonna suggest that um, maybe we take a break, a brief break, and people are, have, you're welcome to enter questions in, anything we've talked about in the fidelity manual and the fidelity scale so far. Um, but then I wanna shift gears when we reconvene and I wanna start talking about the fidelity review process because I think I anticipate, I should say, we'll have additional questions there. I mean, the, the manual and the scale are kind of, they kind of are what they are. Um, so I think the question, a lot of the questions we had yesterday were more of a fidelity review sort of tone. So, um, so I'm going to go ahead and say it's five after. Let's let's reconvene at quarter after the hour. And I know yesterday I really messed that up. I mean, 15 minutes after the hour. When I say quarter after the hour, <laughs> <laughs> I did job. some work. I did some work on uh, you know how to read time and that sort of thing yesterday uh, after we met. So I'm better today. Um, but we'll get back together at 15 minutes after the hour. And we'll start talking about um, your questions first, and then we'll start talking about the fidelity review process uh, with the rest of our time together today. And we're in a great place on time. We're going to have time for additional questions, too, at the end. Um, so don't worry about time. Um, we're going to be A-OK. -okay. And I'll see you all in a
Okay, as we're waiting for some folks to join still, I've got a couple minutes left here, I think. Um, we do have a question in there. Um, and I'll wait until about one, oh, I'm sorry, I'll wait until about 15 minutes after the hour to to answer that one. Um, but please, if you're having questions, please type them in. We want to answer your questions um, so that you walk away from this kind of feeling prepared. And I think that's really, for me, that's really the most important thing is you walk away from this feeling prepared. Um, maybe not to do a fidelity review tomorrow, but you feel like you've got a base level of knowledge um, that gives you at least a level of confidence in, you know, your ability to kind of uh, assess what's in front of you with the help of a fidelity review team, if you want to think about it that way. Um, and like I said yesterday, and I think Dawn mentioned this and Darren too, um, I think the idea here from here would be that you observe, if you still want to be a fidelity reviewer after listening to me for two days, uh, um, <laughs> the uh, I think the idea would be that you observe some fidelity reviews, um, get your get your feet under you there, and then and then give it a shot. Just well, I would just mention to you all that that uh, you know we Darren and I um, each have conversations with uh, potential reviewers prior to the review and and uh, answer questions on a one to one basis. We offer more information kind of on a two or three to one basis. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know just uh, try to help reviewers feel as comfortable as they're going to feel going into the review. One of the other things that we want to try and do after lunch, um, I think, is I have links to various videos that were done by the Westat staff. They were actually Dartmouth staff at that point in time. Uh, the IPS that was purchased by Westat. Um, they're pretty cheesy, <laughs> but, but cheesy actors. It's the, it's the Westat staff that are doing the, the actual videos. But I have to say, I think they, they create a little more in the way of a comfort level. Um, you know, as an example, the, the interview with participants in the program, the video has three participants and has two interviewers and shows the questions that they might ask and kind of shows how it would could go. And I think it just feels a little more comfortable when you've seen, uh, you know, an actual example of how some of the interviews could go. So we have links sure. to send those out. Sadly, we can't show them on GoToWebinar. Don't you know that's not available to us? Um, but we can send out the links and have people look at them and then reconvene and, you know, 10 minutes or something along that line, because they're all very short, um, and then discuss. What did you see? How do you think you think it prepared you for being, oops, sorry, <laughs> and I'm going to stop talking there. <laughs> that'll be good. Uh, that'll be very good, I think. Um, so we do have some questions. Uh, maybe this is as good a time as any to kind of transition over to the questions here that folks have popped in. Uh, so it looks like Gene has a question here. Does every organization have a supervisor for the vocational unit? If they do not have a supervisor, do we go to the lead employment specialist for some answers? Great question. Um, every organization kind of sets it up differently. Uh, it's not good or bad or better or best, but some organizations have a full-time IPS supervisor, and that is their title. Others have a manager um, that manager that manages multiple sort of parts of the organization. Um, and, uh, you know, if you look at the staffing part or the supervisor part, <clears throat> I think an IPS supervisor, a full-time IPS supervisor can have up to 10 employment specialists. So there is quite a bit of capacity. So um, if you're a half-time IPS employment supervisor, you could have up to five employment specialists before you'd need either more time or more help. Um, so there is some flexibility. And again, on day one, you really want to kind of get that um, under, you want to understand their setup um, on, on day one from an organization. Um, so um, it, that's another kind of answer of it depends, unfortunately, Gene, but every organization kind of sets it up how it has to make sense within their within their organization, but good question. Um, Nina hey, has Paul, asked, just, yeah. Jump in on that one. Um, the HCA is really um, reaching out to uh, organizations who are just starting up the IPS program. So there's some reviews I've conducted where the employment specialist and the supervisor is all in one person, it's all one person wearing multiple hats just because they're in a startup program and they're trying to leverage funds 
to, um, you know, expand and build up. And that's one of the recommendations that I've made in the past that just, you know, you have enough people coming in the program, it's time to hire more staff. So it is pretty unique on um, the agency and um, in it. Before the review comes up, I'm in contact with the Fidelity site to get information that I can share with the review team so that we are um, aware of the list of activities prior to the review happening. Okay, great. Thanks for chiming in with that one. Um, one of the things that I think both both Darren and I do, and I apologize if I'm, I'm repeating, I obviously real life intruded with the phone call from my daughter. <laughs> when we, we send out the agenda letter that looks very much like the one in the manual, we tweak it for virtual and we tweak it for a variety of other things to some degree. We send the reviewers a copy of that when we send it out to the agency so that they can see kind of in, in one shot the expectation as far as interviews, amount of time, documents, and that kind of thing. I think that also helps with with uh, uh, kind of the, the comfort level the, uh, uh, related to being a reviewer. So that's one of the other things that we do here anyway. Sure. No, that makes sense. Material. Yep. Makes a lot of sense. And I see um, you chimed in on uh, Nina's question there in the chat too, Dawn. Um, so appreciate that. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to working with Nina and, and, and in fact, a variety of other folks that I think are on the call. I can promise you all, you won't be in a fidelity review situation as a reviewer where you don't learn something. There's always something you pick up from someone else, whether it's an interpretation or whether it's um, something they've seen that you haven't, and they can kind of share that anecdote with you and how they, how the review team kind of scored that item. Um, so it's it's a really neat, really collaborative sort of approach. I really, really enjoy it. Um, I really do. <clears throat> Now, um, after a day and a half, we're going to talk to you about fidelity reviews, um, and hopefully you can understand why we kind of front loaded this training with the content of the fidelity scale. You know, it, it's it's really what you need to know as much, maybe even a little bit more than the fidelity review process. The re review process is important. Don't get me wrong, but really, once you've been a part of a couple, three fidelity reviews. Um, it's it's they're all going to be similar really similar the problem is the content you're going to review in all those reviews will have all kinds of variability so that's why we spent so much time kind of going through the fidelity scale and fidelity manual with you um, because that's the content that you'll really need to review during a fidelity review in order to score uh, the most appropriately um, so as we kind of walk through this, um, and again, if I'm just looking at the Fidelity Review Manual, I'm actually gonna get out of the Fidelity Scale. I'm gonna get out of the Fidelity, or I'm gonna stay in the Fidelity Review Manual in the Table of Contents. It's got an introduction to Fidelity um, and Supported Employment Overview. I'm gonna skip that. Um, I'm just gonna go right to an overview of the scale. We went through all of this, right? So if something happens and Dawn and Darren contact you and you're going to go to your first fidelity review and all of a sudden you're like, oh gosh, I forgot everything about the fidelity scale. What do I do? It's conveniently right here in front of you in the beginning of the manual. It talks about who rates what, who you should interview, what sort of basic skills you might need. Um, and so you're going to need the knowledge of IPS supported employment right out of the gates, right? Um, uh, and then it also talks to you about um, what to do with missing data. Um, so it says here, if reviewers do not obtain necessary information at the time of the site visit, they should collect it at a later date, either by telephone or through another visit. Uh, if you can't find information to score an item, the default value is one. Um, even if an item does not appear to an agency, the item is still rated. For example, if the agency does not have a mental health treatment team, the item is scored a one or a two, depending on whether the components of the criterion are present. Um, and so I, I just want to kind of put it out there um, about, you know, what you do if you can't find or they don't produce data. Um, and Gene, it's, uh, you're saying no sound. Um, I don't think that's on my end. Can Dawn and Darren, can you hear me? I can. I had a actually call in. Some 
Um, I guess I would wonder, are others that didn't call in uh, unable to hear? I know both Darren and I, I had called in, so problem. that's working. Sorry. Yeah, for some reason I had some audio issues using my computer this morning, so I had to call. Harrison says he can hear. Okay. Gene, I wonder if there's something going on with here specifically. Sometimes Paul says he can hear. Um, Rebecca, Rebecca can says hear. I can hear, but not call yeah. in. So, Gene, I wonder if you maybe need to um, exit out and come back in again. Sometimes that happens. Or look at the up above where it says audio. You can do what, what some of us have done, and there's a phone number um, and the, the login information to be able to call and get back in to your audio that way. Hopefully that helps. Um, yeah, Focus. and just keep firing questions away at us. If, if you are having continued trouble, we'll try to problem solve it, um, help you out. Um, <clears throat> We've talked about a fidelity report, and so this fidelity manual goes into great lengths talking about what the fidelity report is, how it should look, what it should contain. Um, it's got a really detailed report and a sample report later in this document, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on you know, what constructs the fidelity report, because we'll get to that um, eventually anyway. Um, so preparing for a site visit. So now you know uh, you're going to get a golden envelope delivered to you with, by an owl from Dawn and Darren that says you are a fidelity reviewer at the next one. <laughs> um, so um, <laughs> what what you'll do when you get that is you if you're not the lead reviewer, you're probably not going to do a lot of this stuff, but it's good for you to know what goes on kind of behind the scenes. So. Behind the scenes, the first thing you want to try to do with an organization is schedule the review, right? And sometimes that's really the toughest part, is finding two days in a row. And again, some of this is pre-COVID that I'm talking about, but th think about what you're asking an organization. Kind of stop what you're doing for two days so we can come in and ask you a bunch of questions about your work. Um, and, and that can be a real challenge for some organizations. So schedules are tight for everybody that I know, uh, and, and I don't think that's different in the state of Washington. Um, so what you want to do is try to first negotiate a date for the for the fidelity reviews. Um, I've been in places where uh, there's really not a negotiation and it's kind of like this is the date we're showing up and you might not be surprised to know that when you get in there as a fidelity reviewer it's already sort of a weird feeling in the room because you've told them hey we're coming on this date. So uh, if you have the ability uh, when you're a lead reviewer to give any sort of flexibility in scheduling it that is super super convenient for organizations and it's a nice courtesy. Um, uh, it, it could happen that a fidelity visit might be rescheduled because there's turnover before the visit. So if you're going to go review an organization and they, for whatever reason, two of their employment specialists, the two, their only two employment specialists are no longer there, um, it's going to be a pretty weird review. You're not going to be able to do a lot of the review. So you may want to reschedule. Um, so just kind of putting it out there, um, these are some flexibilities. You'll have an agency contact person and Dawn and Darren, I'm sure they have a specific person that they talk with at each organization that's, you know, kind of like the point person. Um, and a lot of this you want to get ironed out well in advance. And they've got a nice little timeline here. Um, so this fidelity review uh, happens November 13th. And by October 10th, they're trying to get everything put in place and started here according to this timeline. And this timeline goes from October 10th, the fidelity visit being November 13th and 14th, and then it's got December 10th being sort of the last date on the timeline for follow-up with agency um, to summarize findings. Um, Jean is still saying she can't hear anyone. Um, just FYI, Darren and Dawn. Um, I wonder if that's on her end, uh, unless others have no sound. Um, oh, she can hear now. I'm just going to keep going. Thanks, Gene. Um, that's the, the first rule, right? Don't ask questions when it's working. Um, <laughs> um, this shared understanding part, um, I, I, I'll sum it up just by saying um, we want to help agencies get better at doing IPS. That's really our, our fundamental purpose, right? Um, 
often for agencies that I'm very familiar with, maybe I've done several reviews with, I might ask them on day one, you know, what can we do as reviewers? What can we highlight for you that will help you grow your IPS? And, and as that discussion unfolds, what we really try to help agencies understand is if there are certain things that would be beneficial to you to have in the IPS Fidelity Report, um, let us know. And, and we're happy to help out that way. And it doesn't mean that alone will fix things. But if if um, if showing the agency CEO the Fidelity Report that says the Fidelity reviewers think you need to hire an additional employment specialist based on the workload, sometimes that's helpful in making the overall argument to get an employment specialist. Um, so it is a collaborative uh, approach. And you do want to have, um, you know, sort of a almost like a, a plan with the organization of how we're going to do this fidelity review. And I'm not saying they're going to tell us how to score or anything like that, but we want to help their agency get better. And there's a lot of different ways that an agency can get better. Um, and so we certainly want to be helpful and highlight things in our report if that's something that's advantageous. We've talked when we've gone through the fidelity scale about all the things we're going to ask for from the site in advance. Um, and Dawn, right now, Dawn and Darren, um, when uh, like when you're doing a fidelity review and you're looking at, let's say, the list, uh, you, the, the diversity of job types, is that something they email to you or do you have them like pull it up on a screen virtually? We have them email it to us. Um, okay. We have the agency back scheduled Zoom meetings. Um, sometimes during the Zoom meeting, they might, you know, pull it up on the, the screen for us to look at, but they do email. They email brochures and things like that. We've tried to encourage agencies to allow us access to their electronic health records to give us a temporary login, mm -hmm. but sometimes that kind of stuff, you know, the the, the chart information is also uh, emailed to us in an encrypted email in a, 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 a secure format. Yeah. Um, so we were on a lot of, of that. The agency is the one that ends up scheduling the Zoom meetings for the most part and things along that line because they have the email addresses of the people that we're going to be interviewing so um, sure, that's that one thing sense. that's done kind of the agency yeah. that makes a lot um, of sense and that that uh, chart information i mean that's got to be the trickiest part um i'm sure people in the yeah. it world are kind of like no way no how you know <laughs> you're not letting somebody log in yeah. from somewhere else <laughs> no thanks um and that's usually a limitation even if you're on site you know i've been at places where the it in that particular organization does not do like burner admin type um, view only logins that they just don't do it as a matter of policy. So that's when you have to have an employee sitting there with you and, and they're actually going through the record and just showing you the document. Um, so both are fine. You learn to like both. I prefer it when somebody else is clicking through it, just personal preference. Um, it takes longer for me to figure out every place I need to go anyway. So um, so some of the things we're gonna request, we're gonna ask for their IPS staff, everybody on the team, um, whether the positions are full-time or part-time, when they were hired, what their caseloads are. Um, and I don't think I've ever noticed this sentence. Also asks the supervisor to indicate where each person on the caseload receives mental health treatment. Okay, I read that. I think I interpreted that sentence wrong. I thought they were asking for the supervisor to indicate where each employment specialist was receiving mental health treatment. And I was like, well, that seems like that's not <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to no, know that. It could be very right, Paul. <laughs> I don't, I don't want I'm to not know interested. it, but it could be very yeah. right. <laughs> I will not assign a score to that information. Um, so what's this? what this is asking is for all the clients on the caseloads, we want to know which mental health treatment team or treatment team they're working with. Um, and you'll use that to identify, you know, are the employment specialists assigned to two or fewer teams from which 90% of their caseload is, is derived. Um, We'll ask for the current jobs, job titles, job start dates, job end dates, type of employment, and they mean they're a competitive uh, job or not, um, and the names of the employers or businesses. Um, a list of, so part of IPS supported employment is um, something called supportive education. Um, not a lot of agencies also provide supportive education, but some do, and in, in that case, uh, you would also ask for that educational content. That's what this bullet point right here is about. Um, let's see here. Okay, You'll I'll ask. Say, I will say that it, it, it's, a, it's a billable service within uh -huh. 
the Medicaid array of services that a supported employment agency can provide. So I think sometimes agencies don't understand that. Once again, it's not something we get into in the, the IPS review, but I just wanted to mention that it is a billable service. Sure. Some of that too, if you're serving um, an all adult population, I think you naturally have fewer people that are interested in supportive education. Some are, but um, if you're working with that adolescent range and kind of early, um, you know, youth transitioning to adulthood, you know, 18 to 25, I think it's more common there is, is what I've seen. Um, I see that, and I see the folks that maybe have had a physical disability that prevents them from doing the work they did before. We talk about, do you want to be retrained in something in order to, you know, to further your career from, so I, I had actually on my case of kind of a lot of people that um, ended up with, with physical issues, bad back or whatever that prevented them from continuing to do what they had done. And that was the cause of their depression. So we talked about, what do you want to be retrained in? Sure. That makes sense. If, it really is um, uh, super specific to each organization, isn't it? Kind of what you see when you show up, even though everybody's looking at the same fidelity scale. Um, I mean, everybody just kind of assembles it differently. It's the best way I can think of describing it. Um, if people have been in any sort of situational assessment or VOC e eval, um, you're going to want to see that stuff. You can ask for it. A lot of folks might not have it, and that's okay. You'll want to see the IPS specialist and supervisor vacancies in the last six months. Um, documentation, the location of services, and this is where you score like that community. You heard Don talk about brochures, uh, agency brochure or the brochures for a vocational service. Some have IPS on their organization brochure. Some have a specific brochure just for IPS. Um, any fidelity action planning or implementation planning the organization has available, employer contact forms or job development logs for two months, uh, any field mentoring logs when a supervisor is shadowing an employment specialist doing employer contacts, um, and then it says here access to 10 records. Um, you know, pre-COVID, like we were just talking about, we'd go in and they'd kind of set that up for us or have paper charts. Um, during COVID, you kind of do whatever the organization is able to do or able to offer you, I think is the best way to put it out there. And then in terms of activities or interviews, you're gonna wanna help get set up in any way you can. You're gonna certainly meet with the IPS supervisor for a brief orientation to the agency. Usually that's on day one in the morning. And usually it's more than just the IPS supervisor. Usually, usually it's the IPS supervisor, any employment specialists, and sometimes there's even members of the executive team present that just kind of welcome you to the organization and just talk briefly with you about things. You'll wanna observe a vocational team meeting, at least one mental health treatment team meeting. Um, it says here, there's a note, if there's more than one team or they have multiple teams, you wanna observe more than one. Time is really gonna be a factor there, especially now with everything being virtual. Um, it's all the time. It seems like two days is a long time to get all this done, but I guarantee you, you're always looking at your watch, always looking at your watch. Um, you'll spend time interviewing the executive leadership, including the executive director, QA director, and clinical director. If they have a psychiatrist or a medical director or some level of prescriber, um, you'll want to talk with them. You want to interview case managers, service coordinators, therapists, um, whatever the appropriate title is for the organization you're doing a fidelity review with. Um, and if you're if you're going to agency ABC on year one and year two and year three, you're going to want to make sure that on year one and year two and year three that you interview different therapists, different case managers, different service coordinators, so that every year you don't meet with you know Molly, the therapist over and over again. Um, you really want to get a sample from the entire organization if you can. We talked about the observing the IPS specialists doing job development. Um, it says here, avoid shadowing the same specialist and subsequent fidelity visits if possible. But often if, if teams don't have turnover, you're by default going to be seeing the same employment specialist. So I'm less concerned with that one year over year than anything. Um, it, it actually allows you to get um, maybe at a deeper level of conversation with that employment specialist. Um, if you've, you know, spent three years observing, um, observing them in fidelity reviews. <clears throat> uh, you'll definitely interview the IPS employment specialists. Um, 
you want to interview some clients, interview, interview some family members if possible. Um, one tip I learned on an interview is uh, they had individual client interviews set up. And because of time, we asked if we could put them all together in an interview instead of one by one. And we did that. And then afterwards, one client um, identified to the staff members that they um, they felt uncomfortable in the group sort of interview setting. And therefore, they didn't feel confident or comfortable kind of sharing information with us as reviewers. So if there's a way you can sort of be sensitive to all those little changes that we request as reviewers, that's a really good tip that I've picked up. Um, it's something I wouldn't have thought about, but um, now that I know it, I can't unknow it. So um, I always I always ask first. Um, you're going to look at at least 10 records. Um, hopefully you can have a conversation with a vocational rehabilitation counselor or supervisor. Um, it says here, interview a work incentive counselor or benefits counselor. And, and we've already talked. There's not always the opportunity to do that. <clears throat> um, if they have... IPS peer specialists, certainly you want to interview them, uh, and then you'll interview the IPS supervisor. Um, here's an interesting note here. When an agency has more than one IPS team, separate reviews are scheduled for each team. I think that makes sense um, in some cases, but in other cases, it's not as practical, um, especially considering bandwidth of fidelity reviewers in any given state. You know, it's not an infinite pool of people that can go out and do fidelity reviews. So, um, there's an agency, for example, in Chicago that has 11 um, supported IPS teams, and that would mean they get a re yeah that that would mean they get a fidelity review almost every month, and there's not enough fidelity reviewers to do that, <laughs> and and uh, even if there were, and I was that organization, I wouldn't want somebody <laughs> here every month of the year, my goodness. So what we do is we try to do simultaneous reviews where I might be in one office doing a fidelity review on a team here, and then across town there's another set of reviewers doing a review there and we kind of put those two teams reviews together. So they end up having, okay. I think they end up having four reviews a year and we combine multiple teams with reviewers at the same time. That helps because I'm, I'm actually going to have one on in, in my list of agencies that that comes up on for the first time uh, ever. <laughs> uh, this year. So thank you for yeah. that, Paul. I yeah, it's a good problem to I have. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we've, we've seen some success with that. It gets a little goofy as you try to put the report together because you're going to have one team scored a four and the other team scored a five. So, you know, how do you put the final report together? Um, and so what we did is we rated the lowest score for the two teams. So in that example, we on the final report, they'd have a four. And then in the notes, we'd say you know, team A was a four, team B was a five. So our recommendation to team four is to do this, period. Just Good just input. FYI. Yeah, that's a goofy one. It's it's kind of a, it's different. You know how we are in Illinois. We try all kinds of weird stuff. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see here. Harrison has a quick question he put in here. I've noticed most of my clients on my caseload don't want anyone involved with their employment planning or maintaining, especially family and friends, what would you as a reviewer do in this situation? You know, if you've got the client saying, don't include my family and friends in any plans for employment, and I look and on the job search plan or the job support plan, no family is identified, to me, you've answered any question I could have as to why they're not included. Um, I think, you know, each, each client gets to kind of set up their own support network um, and as long as you're respecting that, I, you know, if the client doesn't want you to involve the family, you're not wrong to not involve the family. I think that's that's wise to not do that. Um, I think and, one other thing there too, Paul, is is um, I know when we had a fidelity review at the agency that I was working for several years ago, um, there were a couple of things. There was disclosure and how do you describe it to the person. Um, there was was um, including family members and how do you describe it to the person. There are various other things, and I think both Darren and I are, are uh, I mean, we've seen enough different agencies and heard how agencies explain it where maybe one of them has lots of people that want to have uh, family involved, and then another one has nobody that wants to have family involved. Sure. Um, that could relate to a training in the future. That could relate to discussing how does the one agency describe it that's getting a lot of 
of input from family and things like that. And, you know, is that sure. something you might want to adopt? So. Sure. And, you know, I'll throw in there as well, you know, a monkey wrench that I think we run into a lot in the mental health center side of things is um, there are clients that we work with that even if their family wanted to be involved, there's no way in heck we'd advocate for it because their family is part of the challenge, you know. Yeah. Um, yep. It's an yep. unhealthy connection. And we, you know, we think they'd fare better without including them on their list, um, to yep. put it mildly. <laughs> Yeah, every circumstance is individualized. I think this just gives yeah. employment specialists tools um, to use as appropriate. Yep. Um, you know, if, if they're if truly a person needs extra support, their family is supportive. You know, how do you talk to them about that? Yeah, um, exactly. That's um, but as a default, as a fidelity reviewer, if you're not including the family and it's because the client said they don't want the family involved, I, I that's okay with me. That's totally okay with me. Um, I pulled up a sample schedule of an IPS supported employment fidelity review, um, and it's good for you to kind of take a look at what the work day is for, and remember, this is pre-COVID. I know I say that a lot, but it's good to remember. It's probably not appreciably different in terms of um, content, but it might be different today in terms of format. Um, for sure. So day one, you know, you get there, you kind of get an overview of the agency, an overview of the IPS services within the agency. Then you might go observe a mental health treatment team meeting at nine o'clock. And that's where you sit on a, in a chair in a room where they're meeting and you, you kind of are in listen only mode. Then you might transition over to interviews with case managers or service coordinators. Um, it says here each reviewer independently interviews one practitioner. But again, you know, to try to stay on track, you may start combining interviews with like all of the case managers together, for example, just to try to get a little extra time, not so you can cut out earlier or anything like that, but you want to make space for all the stuff that's not in the schedule. So like the records review here is at one o'clock, one to two thirty. I can tell you right now, you're not going to review 10 records in an hour and a half at any organization is my guess. Um, so you're going to need extra time. Taken. Yeah, it's been taking more like three or four hours because oh, yeah. of the nature of doing it electronically. It really is one of the, it probably is the toughest thing to do in this kind of virtual world. Yep. And so often what we'll do is the fidelity reviewers that I've worked with is we'll meet on day one, maybe it's before lunch or maybe it's in the morning, but we'll look at the schedule and we'll kind of say, okay, Paul, if you take the records review from one o'clock until you're done, we can we can do the interviews you know, kind of on our own, if if we can, if we want to get the records reviews done today, and certainly knowing what day two holds, um, you know, would be, that would be, that might be worthwhile, for example, is to try to split everything up. So they have the day two ending at one o'clock. I don't know how reasonable that is, just off the top of my head. Um, I don't know that I've ever walked Doesn't out of an organization at one. You're right. I don't think I've ever had a review, even when my agency was reviewed, that we got away with a one o'clock ending. <clears throat> no, no. I. This is, uh, you know, an example to end all examples, right? Um, that's okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, usually they go um, well into day two after lunch, I promise. Um, <laughs> something worth noting, too, it's got a section here on confidentiality, and I think they really maybe give it light duty here. Um, so it's okay to ask whether you need to sign a confidentiality agreement, but usually you don't. I don't think I've ever had to sign one. It says here, remove client names from all documents you take from the agency. I'll tell you what, just don't take anything away from the agency. That's the easiest way to do it, to keep yourself out of hot water. Um, so, you know, you don't have the wind blow stuff out of your hands or whatever. Um, leave everything at the agency that they share with you. You've got two days to review it. You've got two days to look at it, to make notes on it. There's really no reason for you to have a client name in your back pocket as a fidelity reviewer anyway. Uh, so again, from a professionality standpoint and sort of a standard of care standpoint, um, you know, when we all show up to, a, to an organization to do a fidelity review, I'm gonna bring with me a notepad. I'm gonna bring with me the fidelity manual. I'll bring with me the fidelity scale um, and I'm going to leave with my notebook. I'm going to leave with my fidelity manual. I'm going to leave with my fidelity scale. If they show me a list of client names and who their job, who their employers are and what their job types are, 
I'll look at it. I'll make notes on it. I'm going to put it back in the middle of the table when I'm done with it. I'm, I'm not putting it in my bag. No way, no how. No, thank you. Um, I just don't think I have any business doing it. Uh, when you do the interview with clients, uh, usually um, I introduce myself and I have them introduce themselves by first name. Um, you know, again, just trying to keep it discreet. And I always tell them, I tell every interviewee that everything you say is confidential and will only be used to help score the fidelity review. Um, and whatever notes or comments we make will be de-identified. So, um, whether it's a client or a therapist who says, I don't, I'm afraid, you know, what I say is going to get them in trouble. You know, we're not going to say, Jane, the therapist told us that you guys do it this way. Um, we're just not going to do that. Um, we're going to have a level of professionality. Um, we're there to help. We're not there to point fingers or anything like that. And I don't I know, Jared and Dawn. Okay, good. I'm, I was, I was going to kick it out to you both. I, I figured you guys would have comments. Cool. On that part. <laughs> um, yeah being reviewed signs a contract it has a lengthy section related to HIPAA in it uh, the agent the agencies that are, are volunteering not volunteering sending and the, the agency gets paid for it they have a contract as well and there's a once again lengthy section related to HIPAA and don't so um, that's the way that we've handled it some agencies as we're doing fidelity reviews will also have a sign of confidentiality statement um, because it differs as far as how we get the record, sometimes we access the, the electronic record and when we leave then we are leaving it. We don't we don't get to don't have to take it along with us. Other times they're sending us an email with confidential documentation via an encrypted method and then it's up to us in order to um delete those things when we're done looking at them. So sure. it is a little different. Um there is a big section in each of the contracts that talks about HIPAA. Um, and then it comes down to us in regards to uh, being honest and ethical with just deleting that information once we're done. Yep, absolutely. Um, you know, at a but minimum, told, you got to remember you're a, a guest at a minimum. Right. And truth be told, it's not different than, um, uh, you know, I was on a review one time where they had confidential information and, and the agency was kind of checking it back in and said, we're missing such and such. Somebody accidentally put it in their folder and they took it with them. Um, you know, so the electronic version of that is not really that different from the paper version of that. You've got to be mindful of getting rid of it, turning it back in, whatever it ends up being the case at, for that specific agency. Yep. Good information, Don. Thank you. And, and usually what happens in most fidelity reviews when you're there in person is you're, you're kind of set up in a room. So, you know, on the day of the fidelity review, you'll report to the agency and you'll go to the, usually there's a reception desk or something similar. And you say, I'm, I'm Paul, I'm here for a fidelity review for the employment program. And they say, oh, sure, one second. And usually some you know, supervisor or somebody comes and gets you and walks you back to this room in like a conference room of sorts. And usually that's kind of like your home base. Um, that's where you can set your stuff. Sometimes, you know, uh, really super awesome kind agencies have some coffee and maybe some donuts or something, you know, that they're trying to, you know, ply you with. Um, and I'll take all the coffee I can get, trust me. Um, and sometimes that room doubles as a place you do the interviews. Sometimes it's just kind of like the headquarters where you go back to after the interviews. But either way, most of the time when it's time to review the records, um, if it's a paper record, they'll kind of have a little medical record slash chart cart that they bring it in on and they'll bring them in and you review them right there. You put them back on the cart and then when you're done with them, they wheel them out. Um, other times, if it's an electronic medical record, somebody will come in with a laptop or you'll go to like a computer lab type place and they'll kind of walk you through the record. Um, but like Dawn says, um, you know, the agencies have a responsibility to protect information just like you do as a reviewer. So there's a couple layers and we don't say any of this to spook you, but there's a couple layers before it even gets to you as a reviewer of sort of protection and, and guarding the privacy. We're just saying it because I think it's wise to just remind you that as a visitor, um, you know, the last thing you want to do is take a, a chart for a client receiving services back to your hotel room to review it. First of all, you shouldn't be reviewing anything as a fidelity reviewer overnight on day one anyway. Um, you should manage your time during the day to do it at the agency. Um, and I know that's easy peasy, you know, easy to say and that sort of thing, but um, you want to save your evening for catching up on your day job and, um, 
maybe look comparing your notes to the scoring sheet, but uh, you shouldn't be doing anything in your hotel room to arrive at a fidelity score, you know, like reviewing material or anything like that. That that wouldn't be, um, I don't I don't think that's how it's set up um, in Washington or anywhere really. Um, so you get there, we talked about kind of what happens when you get there, they walk you back to the room and whatnot. Um, there's almost always somebody who can't make it to an interview. They call in sick or they had a crisis or whatever, and that's okay. Um, just be flexible. If you can't, if you had a nine o'clock interview and uh, they can't make it, um, you are welcome to ask, is there someone else that we could, we could interview instead? Um, and if there isn't, um, my, my kind of natural default is, okay, well, maybe it's a good time to start the chart reviews since I've got time <laughs> um, and just kind of start picking away at them. I have, I think people love it when I show up on a fidelity review because as soon as I walk in the door, I'm thinking about chart reviews and it's not because I love them and I'm a geek, it's because I want to get them done and over with. Uh, so I am looking <laughs> to bang them out and get them done and not have to worry about it at 4 p.m. on day two. Um, I've been in fidelity reviews where it's 3.30 on day two and somebody says, oh, by the way, I didn't make it through all the charts. We still have six more. And it's kind of like, oh, what? Come on. Um, Come on, you gotta be a good fidelity review team. You know, you gotta you gotta protect each other's time like that. Um, so um, don't be afraid to start chart reviews, even if they take a long time. You know, you, nobody thinks once you start chart reviews that you're gonna rip through all ten in an hour. Like Dawn said, they take some time, but that's all the more reason to everybody have everybody roll up their sleeves and really get into them and get them over with, because um, it's what takes the longest for sure, in my opinion. Um, so you'll meet with everybody, you'll have a little overview, here's how things happen at this organization, and then you'll start breaking out into your interviews. Now I will tell you, if you're a new reviewer, it's your first Fidelity review where you're a co-reviewer, um, you know, one of the scary parts I think is you get turned loose for an interview and it's just you interviewing somebody because you think like, oh gosh, like I've never really interviewed somebody for a fidelity review and then you'll have this crisis where you think I've forgotten all of the questions I should ask oh my gosh what do I do remember you got your fidelity manual it's got sample questions in it in the back of it is the fidelity scale and it'll tell you exactly how to score things and we talked a little bit yesterday and we talked a little bit today about how do you walk backwards into the questions from the scoring and I think Darren even shared that he has had to do that a few times too so um, Breathe deeply, get through that because you're going to be okay. Um, and I always start interviews. It, it does, I think it really starts to, um, I don't know what the right word is. I don't know. Let everybody kind of ease into an interview just by saying, tell me about what you do for, you know, if it's the employment specialist you're interviewing, tell me about what you do every day. Just have them start there. And then they're going to tell you, oh, well, you know, today or, the, you know, I did this or on, a, on an average day, I do this, that or the other. And from there, you're really quickly going to start picking up on, oh, you did a vocational assessment. What, do those usually take you one session? Uh, and then they're going to say, no, I usually do them over the course of a couple sessions, maybe three. Um, and then you can say, do you ever update it? Well, yeah, I update it when this happens or when that happens or when the other happens. And you just try to make it. Um, organic and you know kind of laid back the last thing i think that you want to do is have somebody feel like they're being interrogated um you know and kind of like here's the question there's their answer here's the question there's their answer um there is sort of a, a style you'll develop and i always like to remind people in these trainings I, I am a guy that was an ips supervisor for several years so i've been on the other side of this before i was a fidelity reviewer and that has influenced my style as a fidelity reviewer, um, as it will happen the same way for all of you. And Dawn, I think you're probably in the same boat. You remember all of those IPS fidelity reviews where you were chewing on your nails and sweating before they showed up because you wanted to get a good score um, <laughs> and, and you wanted to say the right thing. And um, so mm -hmm. the last thing I want to do is, you know, exacerbate anybody's anxiety because at the end of the day, remember what we're all here to help them get better. So there's no gotcha. Um, you know, calm demeanor as a fidelity reviewer, especially when you're talking with the clients and their families, um, you know, that's worth noting too. Um, the last thing you want to do is get a client, you know, anxious or agitated just because you're trying to understand from them how, you know, what their experience is with the IPS team. Um, 
this has got a nice discussion guide in the fidelity manual um, and it talks about how you just like I was just saying how do you start your fidelity review kind of interview um, it is nice to kind of um, put out there you know we're going to meet for about this long I'm really just looking for suggestions on ways to improve services to support people like you who want to go to work um, I remind people that their participation is voluntary. If at any time they want to get up and walk out, they don't have to excuse themselves or anything. They can go. You know, if they have to use the restroom, they can go. That's fine. Um, um, let's see here. I, I have never told anybody that it's all confidential unless you tell me you want to hurt yourself or someone else. In those cases, I have to, I'm required by law to report it. I, I've never, I've never had to say that out loud. Um, and I think, I guess what I would say too is uh, while this is technically a limitation to the confidential nature of your interview, um, you have the treatment team there. You're not there as a treatment professional. So uh, while I'm sure all of us are mandatory reporters, um, like I'm not going to do the crisis evaluation in an organization if somebody identifies that they're suicidal. Like that would be, that would be wholly inappropriate and unethical for me to do it, even though I'm a counselor and can do it. Um, the, the right thing for me to do is to get help from the treatment team and say, I'm doing this interview and this person identified to me that they'd like to harm themselves. Um, and I'd like to make sure that they get treatment for that. Uh, and then the team would, the clinical team would take over from there. So that has not happened to me. Um, and I, I don't think it will happen to you either. Um, and Dawn, Darren, I don't know if you put that out there that, you know, you, you would report it if someone would hurt themselves or someone else. I I haven't ever put it out. I suppose it it could be a good caveat, but I've never I've never actually had anybody talk that way. Um, yeah. I, you know, and I think I think partially because the agencies handpick um, the people that are going to be part of it. That's not necessarily the person that they would pick unless something's really deteriorated between the time they talk to them and the um, and the time that, um, you know, we meet with them. So sure. that's my thought. Yep. No, I agree. I agree. Yeah. I run across that, but uh, yeah. definitely something to keep in mind. And I think I would just like, yeah, I'd definitely redirect it to the support person there who has the connection with the individual right. to provide sense of support. Right. Um, I agree. Um, well, let's do this. I got that we're right at the hour here. Um, maybe it's worth taking a break. Um, I know people are going to get a lunch. And so, Dawn, Darren, I know we've got videos we also want to incorporate into the rest of our time today. So I'll kind of leave it to you to tell me how long we want to break for lunch and then we, when we want to reconvene with the videos. Um, so you just tell me how you, how you want to kind of put that out there and I'm, I'm, that's what we'll do. I I tried to send the link and interestingly enough it in, ended up being a response to Paul when he said I can hear you. Um, I sent the link to um, West staff doing uh, a mock interview with participants group interview, um, and I didn't think it sent, and so I sent it again. So I'm going to try it one more time and not respond to Paul in this case, hopefully, mm -hmm. um, and, and send it to you. And that's something that, that after lunch, uh, it takes about the video's 11 minutes long. We'll have folks watch the, the video on your own computer from that link. And then we'll reconvene after that to just discuss, you know, what'd you think? What could you score based on that? And that kind of thing. Um, just to add a little, little more in the way of the real life deal and kind of knowing what you're getting into. So, like I say, I'll try one more time to send the link and not have it go to just Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Although it says the responses to everyone might be able to might be able to pull it from that um, to uh, to use. Um, so anyway, I goofed. So, that's okay. <laughs> so, so, you it into chat. Yeah, I, I, I it ended up going to Paul Muir as a response to his comment that he could hear. Uh, I see. <laughs> and why it ended up going there, I like I say, I goofed. So um, the link is there, the YouTube video, yeah, they're cheesy actors, that's okay, <laughs> it's kind of fun. <laughs> uh, so would you like to break for, uh, what did we do yesterday, 45 minutes about? Was that enough for everybody? Yeah, yeah I think 45 makes makes sense.
Okay, we can do that, uh, and then we'll come back. And minutes. then Paul's saying thirty-minute lunch with a question. Um, yeah, I'm I'm okay with whatever. So, um, how about this? What if we come back after forty-five minutes and have watched the videos? How about that? Yep. You can yep. eat lunch Absolutely. and all of that. Um, okay, so yep. I will see everybody. And I learned yesterday that I should say I will see everybody at quarter till. Um, uh, <laughs> and we'll we'll see you on the other side. See, it's it's real time learning. Everybody's you know always getting better, right? Um, <laughs> I will see you all on the other side then. Um, quarter till. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Um, thanks, Don. Right, thanks.
Okay, we'll wait just about another minute for folks to come on back and have that video viewed. And you know, I have tried several times to put the video just in the you know bottom of the chat box, send it to everybody, and instead it goes on a response to somebody's question. So I think uh, Nina's uh, comment on the bottom, that's where the, the link shows up too. And Paul's, and it's like, good grief, why, why won't it let me do what I want to do? <laughs> oh. um, well, it ended up working for me um, just when I clicked it. So, and I've seen that video. That, that's the video I thought of. I'm glad you shared that one. As corny as it may be, I think that's actually a pretty good video. Yeah, I think so, too. It, 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 it you know, my, my intent is just to make it... Um, possible to see some facsimile of what uh, that might look like so yeah it, it doesn't yeah Plus, um, I love the little guy <laughs> with the hat yeah he's pretty awesome um I like him too um and so I pulled up sort of in the background once I realized what video it was the sample questions from the fidelity manual for people using IPS services which I think a lot of us call clients or consumers or customers, mm -hmm. um, and so I don't know. Um, you know, I guess I'll need some input from the crowd here on, you know, a at a minimum what they thought of the video, what they noticed about the video, but then also just pulling up some of these questions. Hopefully, you can see how. I think Galen and Sandy did a nice job of making it a very conversational uh, interview. Um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't really, a, you know, very formalized sort of interview which i think always helps with clients clients um respond to that sort of thing um i think in a way that maybe you know maybe like a treatment professional is more used to um but they got a lot of good information in a short amount of time i think it was an 11 minute video right um a lot of information yep. in a short amount of time out of three different clients so um one thing i noticed they did not really get into asking was specific questions about um you know, how long did it take you to meet with somebody from the program, from the employment program? Um, and that's okay. That's not wrong, especially if you're going to make a calculation anyway. Um, but I usually ask, I like that they ask, how did you hear about it? Um, found out the case manager referred, I think the guy in the hat. Um, um, so yeah, I, overall, good video. I, I, I really like that one. Uh, that's one of the ones on there that I think is... Uh, very low on the, the corny scale. Um, <laughs> and I see Pam put in a question here. Um, typically, would a client group be interviewed at the same time? Well, they could, Pam. Um, a lot depends on where it's at in the schedule. Uh, a lot depends on the clients that are going to agree to be interviewed. Um, I've done both in individual interviews, and then I've done some interviews where it, it is a group like that. There's an efficiency you get as reviewers if you can kind of get three or four people in a room from the same sort of stakeholder group, like clients or therapy staff or case management staff. There's kind of a, an efficiency of time you get by putting them all in a room and interviewing them together. And I, I feel like people, whatever sort of walk of life people are from, I, I feel like people tend to be a little bit more likely to contribute like with depth when there are others in the room that they can kind of build off of an answer you know they can chime in kind of from their perspective so there there are some efficiencies it's not required um, to have them in a group and I'll just put out there two reasons I might split them out individually is let's say you had two clients uh, scheduled for an interview and then you have another client scheduled for an interview that is bringing their mom with I might interview the client with mom separate from the other two for many reasons, um, but primarily because I don't know, I don't want to know, I guess, all of the legalities of should mom be in a room with two people who identify themselves as clients. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. So I think there's a uh, almost a privacy sort of portion there um, of, of the consideration. So um, good question, Pam. Um, what are some other things folks noticed or questions people have about the video or why did they ask this or why didn't they ask that? 
And I will say just kind of as a, a standard practice, the letter that I send out, the agenda letter, and you know, please send us back who we're interviewing when, um, I offer in that if an individual is uncomfortable talking in the group, we'll schedule something separate. So also, you know, anxiety level kinds of things, you know, whatever. Uh, if a person just doesn't feel comfortable talking in the group, I'll offer that uh, uh, as an option. Or somebody, I, several times people have ended up getting job interviews that overlap with the interview after they said they would be part of it, uh, which is a grand thing to have. Yeah. Um, and so we've set up a different day and time to, to talk with them. Well, that's a good problem to have, isn't it? You betcha. Yeah, I like that when that happens. <clears throat> Um, I'm not seeing a lot of other comments come in. One of the things I'll point out while we're all um, just kind of looking at this together, this section of the Fidelity Manual that's got questions for each sort of stakeholder group, this is the questions for um, peer specialists. I must have skipped over. Uh, there's, there's sample questions for people using IPS or clients. Not only does it have the questions here in the left column, but it tells you what Fidelity item the question relates to, which I think is really, really handy, especially early in your fidelity reviewing career, um, to be able to kind of translate the question to the fidelity scale. That's always uh, very, very helpful, I think. Um, well, I shouldn't say even for new reviewers, because I think I still use it too. So um, yeah, it's just nice to I have it right there. All our, our instructions. Um, as they were leaving for lunch, might have caused people to think they're supposed to watch the video and then come back at one. Oh, okay. So I kind of wonder maybe if that's the case. It's sort of, um, I think we sort of came across that way. So it may be that we're not going to get um, much until one o'clock. Well, that's another nine minutes. Would you rather that we just kind of mute for a few minutes and then? Um... I think reconvene at one. Yeah, I think so. And I see Paul said didn't watch the video yet, so I think that would. I think he's probably not the only one that would probably be helpful to folks. Okay. Well, I'll, let's do that. I can mute. We'll come back at one, and um, I'll refill my water, and we'll be all set. Cool. All right. Be right back. So if anybody's re returned just now or um, you know, maybe not just settling in, uh, we're watching the video and then we're going to reconvene in order to discuss what, what showed up in the video. And then if anybody had problems getting the link to work, let me know and I can always email it to them if they give me their email address. It's so far sounding like folks can get the link to work.
So is everybody watching the video and making the link work? If it's not, let me know. Definitely the uh, link worked for me, Don. Yeah, it did for me too. Of course, since I was the originator, one would hold. On. <laughs> I was surprised to see that it still said uh, Dartmouth, so they're kind of the classic IPS <laughs> video vault. You're right. Yeah, it is. What did you call vintage? <laughs> vintage IPS. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's actually one other if anybody's interested. I can send out the other links, but there are things like to consensus scoring and watching a, a supported employment unit meeting and I want to say watching job development the other one I got. But once you pull this one up, I think it gives a list of other ones if anybody wanted to watch any of the others. You know, they're kind of right there when you pull up this particular video. In my mind, at least for me, maybe I'd better not say in my mind, it actually did help me um, when I started to do fidelity reviews to see these videos. It helped me to feel a little more comfortable. I probably shouldn't say this, but it's 55 and sunny outside. Feels like a great day to play hooky. And yet here we all are. I am proud of us. Looks like we have a few more people that are um, don't have that little orange triangle, but still several with the orange triangle. So yeah, I think yeah, some people there. were having some difficulty uh, accessing the video. Oh, orange triangle. You know what I mean? Orange triangle shows like whether this is their screen or not. You know, like if they're, it, I think they mean it to be like an at the computer indicator, but. Uh -huh. Yeah. The top of the column says shows when an attendee does not have viewer in the foreground. Yeah. So in other words, they got something else up on their screen, which in this case is probably the video.
So probably a good time just to ask folks to kind of return to the, um, yep. hopefully they've got the audio going in the background and to return to the uh, webinar and we'll do some discussing of the video. Yep, if they can make it back, uh, that would be ideal. I'm already seeing more comments, you know, so uh, I feel like we're headed that direction. Yeah. So since we do have some more people, I think, with us um, than when we originally started, I guess I'll just kind of put out there, um, uh, Dwayne, yeah, we're, we're back now, um, trying to be back now. <laughs> um, just kind of wondering uh, what kind of reactions people had to the video, what you liked, what you noticed, what you maybe didn't like, um, where you thought could have gone differently. Uh, this is just an example. Um, And keep in mind that if you would rather state it verbally than type, I am happy to try and unmute you. Um, so Nina says I'm having intermittent uh, internet issues. Didn't see the whole video, but saved it to you later. That's okay too. Um, and in fact, I think I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send out a thanks for attending kind of email like we usually do with webinars. I'm gonna include in it the chart review form so you guys get a chance to look at that. In case you haven't been able to, to download the um, Fidelity scale or the manual, I'm going to include those. And then anything else that, that Darren and Paul recommend that we should include. But I'm also going to include links to some of the other videos. And I will say that as you watch the video, if you, when you pull it up on YouTube, it gives suggested videos off on your, well, my right anyway, I'm guessing the right. And there are several other Dartmouth, uh, vintage Dartmouth IPS videos that are worth watching too. So, um, and none of them are particularly long, you know, eight to 12 minutes, I think is pretty much the norm. So, um, I do see Rebecca says, I like how conversational it was, which I think helps put everyone at ease. Absolutely. And Definitely. feel less like a past. That's not what it's intended to be. Uh, Paul said the reviewers did a great job, created a friendly, friendly safe environment. And, and absolutely, that's something we try and do um, each time uh, because we want people to get as much out of it as they possibly can, and they're going to get more out of it if they're relaxed. Yep, and I would even go so far as to say, Dawn, that with that particular group of folks, the uh, the consumers or the clients that you're interviewing, you know, if you're going to have an interview where you make it um, – Oh, you bend over backwards to make it a very safe environment. Um, I think that's the group that you want to make it a very safe environment. I mean, not that you don't make it safe for others or anything like that, but I mean, we're we're talking about folks who, um, you know, receive the services and, you know, may have a history of trauma and, uh, you know, all those sorts of things that we all know about uh, the clients that we serve. And so I think it's just um, really vital for you to create kind of a safe space uh, for consumers to share um, their experience. Um, you know, I'm always trying to be aware of, um, you know, if we're interviewing a consumer that, for whatever reason, might feel like they're sharing something that is negative or, you know, critical of the team, the last thing I want to do is have them feel like the reviewers are also judging them. You know what I mean? Um, and so I do try to bend over backwards to make it make sure they understand how it's anonymous and um, we'll share the content, but not who said what and, um, you know, so on and so forth. Um, just again, just for that group in particular, I think it's it's very important um, to put that out there. Did anybody notice uh, questions um, that they thought the reviewers missed or um, maybe? Um, like a follow-up question that could have been asked, but but kind of a missed opportunity. Um, just wondering. And I'll kind of give you an example. Um, so I maybe would have liked to know way more about, um, they talked about the, um, oh, was it janitor? Um, the guy with the hat was talking about how he was doing 
I think it was janitorial. Yeah, he was doing janitorial before he got to the employment team. Um, and his case manager suggested getting to the employment team. And I guess it was unclear to me whether that janitorial was sort of in-house or not. And I, I, just to clarify it, I think I would have wanted to maybe ask a couple follow-up questions about that particular janitorial work and if that was at the agency or not. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah, or through I, some I, sort of arrangement, you know, with a, an employer. Great example, though, in that case of, of at least for that item and the, the gentleman in the hat, he didn't want to do janitorial work. It yeah. came across loud and clear that that was not his preference. And so that was one of the things where you can kind of um, begin to get a score on choice. Wasn't his choice. You see, mm -hmm. Harrison's got a comment. Uh, being in mental health, there's some clients who could definitely go through a group process, but with HIPAA, it would be hard to create a safe space for the information to be shared and not have to worry about another client taking that info. Uh, plus, there's definitely some clients who, uh, who could be uh, could be triggered by group settings, so it can be tricky. Mm -hmm. But I feel HIPAA is the big barrier to this. Um, HIPAA is definitely a barrier. Um, I don't find that people... Because of the questions that are asked, I don't find that 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 people in the program are typically giving a lot of down and dirty, you know, mental health um, issues and what's going on. And it, it really is very much the kind of conversation you have with any person that's got a job. And so they're not sharing, you know, kind of life story, um, really confidential stuff, which is is a, a piece of the reason why I think it's often done in a group. Um, and I, you know, I, I would hope, and I know when we did our, our fidelity review and talked to individuals about being part of the group, we discussed that we picked, we handpicked people first. Um, we handpicked folks that weren't necessarily over sharers, but good communicators. Um, and we also talked with folks about the fact, you know, here's some of the questions that they're going to be asking and going to be employment related and, um, you know, feel free to answer honestly and, things along that line to sort of mitigate anything that might become a HIPAA issue at a later date. Yeah, and I, I would encourage you to, you know, as a fidelity reviewer to ask if people are comfortable um, interviewing together in a group format as opposed to requesting it or assuming it. Um, you know, asking gives people the opportunity to say no, gives the team an opportunity to say really like to, like Harrison's point, Two of the clients we have lined up for you today probably would be fine with it. We'll still ask them, but one we know right out of the gates, absolutely not. Um, and we don't, as reviewers, we don't even need to know the circumstances, um, you know, about why they would or wouldn't be um, a good candidate. So uh, it's less important to me the why of it, and more important that we get it right, I guess, as reviewers. And I don't want to review anybody that doesn't want to be review, interviewed or, um, you know, in a group setting or maybe that shouldn't be. Uh, that I don't, I don't know that that would be a good interview anyway, right? So we got to listen to mm -hmm. the providers on this one uh, for sure. Any other comments yeah. about, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, that, yeah, I, I, I try to set up in the agenda letter that, that very item. You know, please let me know if somebody needs to be interviewed individually if they are not comfortable with the group kind of a thing. That doesn't mean that the person's told them. <laughs> and so your point is a good one. Probably a good idea to ask in that setting, um, just in case somebody's changed their mind once they get there and decide that they don't want to be in the group. So yeah. good good feedback. Yep, and it'll happen. I've had clients that for whatever reason just get, um, I think they just get overwhelmed uh, and kind of walk out. Um, and you know that, I mean, they've got the team right there. I don't need to make a big deal out of it or anything like that. So. Um, I kind of give them permission, like we talked earlier, I kind of give them permission on the front end, um, you know, if you feel like this is overwhelming or, you know, not not what you thought it was going to be, you are welcome to go at any time and uh, that won't mm -hmm. and it, that won't in any way negatively impact the organization. Um, so uh, any other comments or questions about the video, go ahead and pop them in the comments box. What I'm going to do is kind of navigate back up towards the uh, where we left off. I had pulled up those questions. Um, uh, for the clients just to show folks 
kind of the playbook that you could go by. Where we left was, I think where we left was the schedule. And we were talking about the schedule. Um, so this section here is uh, talks about debriefing. And I know this is a difference between kind of how I've done fidelity reviews and I, I think how you might do it in Washington, Don. Um, we really um, try to arrive at at least a tentative score before we leave the organization because that's what organizations really seem to want to know um, with the idea that it's a draft and we're still going to trade notes on the final scoring and then we'll publish a final report for them and then if they want uh, we're happy to review their scores in a phone call uh, once that final uh, report has been delivered. Um, I will put out there, it's important, I think the time frame between the fidelity review and when an organization receives the fidelity report is important to consider. Uh, and so I know you've heard me and Dawn and Darren talk about it for two days now, but it is vitally important that you synthesize your notes in, so that you can complete any scoring that needs to be done in a timely fashion. Um, the last thing we want to do is have a fidelity review in November and then, you know, deliver a fidelity report in March or April or May when so much time has passed by that the organization, I mean, really, they're going to keep doing business as usual unless we deliver that report for them to react to. So we want to make sure we give people as much time as we can, um, you know, to, to take our recommendations to heart and try to make some changes. In the grand scheme of things, 12 months is not a lot of time to make some of the changes that are required um, for fidelity. So um, any any lead time you can give them by getting the report back to them promptly is greatly appreciated. I know folks have shared that with me. Um, Absolutely. I will uh, say, Paul, that, that at least, um, and I don't know if Darren does it this way or not, that's for him to say, but um, what we tend to say in, a, in kind of an exit interview is, we don't have a score for you and we won't until we've done consensus scoring. But here are the positive things that we've seen that we want to share with you, you know, and, and thank you on for hosting us. And then we we spend some time coming up with the list of things that we saw that we were really impressed with. Them. And that's what we share at the exit. And then we let them know we're going to try and get the report to you um, in a month or six weeks <laughs> is typically what we try and do. Um, sure because we have the consensus scoring process and then as part of learning for the fidelity reviewers each reviewer gets to write some piece of it with any assistance that they need you know and they're once again not just turned loose and we provide examples of them. have folks write they turn them into me if i'm the reviewer lead reviewer or darren if he is we put them into one report send the draft back out for everybody to take a look at and that's part of the learning process too is kind of see what was said and then once we finalize it, we send it out to the agency with copies to the review team, typically. Right, and then um, you, but, you also offer that uh, if the organization wants a follow-up call that you'll, the reviewers will get on a call with them, right? Yes, absolutely. Okay. I thought so. Do you have many many agencies take you up on that? Not so many. I, you know, I think, I think we spend a lot of quality time on how to write the report so that it's clear and representative of what we saw and provide viable recommendations. We really spend a lot of time doing that. And so I think by the time they get the report, um, there aren't as many questions. So, yeah, it's the same with me. I don't, I don't, it's the minority of organizations that want that follow up call. I've always found that interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've just had the follow up. There's maybe a couple key elements that. They disagree with and we talk about you know additional materials or the situation and how we came to our decision and the recommendation but um, it, it it's all agency dependent and I think the only other thing that I add during kind of the review because I'm in the same boat with Don that we usually don't I don't have scores available for the exit interview but I want to focus on the positive things and share the positive things that we've seen at the agency and and uh, this open up for additional questions that the agency might have you know going through this two-day process it's it's a lot the virtual is um you know discrete uh sessions as opposed to the two-day face-to-face you're sitting there with the review team and when when everybody leaves the room and you're in there on your own you have little discussions about Here's what I saw, here's what I heard, what do you guys think, are we missing information? 
that we don't get in those discrete meetings. That's still one that I haven't figured out how to and how to work around that effectively because in a Zoom meeting, you don't know whether the person's left or not. And you don't necessarily want to have that conversation in front of whomever. So, sure, um, right. yeah, so that's been hard. And it leaves us with, with uh, you know, not having kind of any idea related to scores and things um, sort of when we're done. Yeah, it's certainly different today. Um, and it has been over the last, you know, 10 to 12 months for sure. I was just kind of curious. Um, since we've t we've kind of dropped the term consensus scoring about 100 times in the last two days, I thought maybe it's worth um, really taking a few minutes on what, what exactly that means for folks in case they're not 100% certain what we mean when we say that. And so consensus scoring is, it's not only an IPS thing. There are um, you know, other industries, I'm sure, that have an equivalent of consensus scoring. Um, but really, what we mean when we're talking about consensus scoring um, with IPS is um, it, it's a meeting, either formal or informal, that occurs um, to sort of finalize the scoring and the ratings, um, resolving disagreements, um, and, and kind of arrive at a final score for each item for a fidelity review. And so I think I mentioned yesterday, if Dawn and Darren and I are on a fidelity review and um, I think somebody's a four, but they both think some agency is a five on a particular item, consensus scoring means during that consensus scoring sort of time period, Darren and Dawn and I are going to talk through why they think it's a five and I'll talk through why I think it's a four. And as you've heard us talk about, it could be that um, they saw something I didn't, or they were in an interview where somebody revealed something I didn't see or hear. And it could also be that while they did the interviews and what they heard score, had them score fives, when I was reviewing the charts, um, I found evidence that whatever this item is actually should be a four. And so we just talked that through and it's not, I know it says resolve disagreements. I don't want you to think that, you know, any voices are raised during consensus scoring because that's never the case. It's it's really more about trading notes on particular items and who saw what and what's the highest we can reliably score on this particular item. Um, we don't ever try to come at it from the other perspective and think what's the lowest we can score. Um, you know, if we can score them a four, but they missed one piece of being scored a five, then the score, the highest we can score them is a four. And so um, while the interviews count for a lot in fidelity, um, really for, as you saw today, I think some of the items in the fidelity scale, I mean, if, if it's not in the chart, it doesn't really matter what they say in the interview because the chart is where you get the sort of evidence to do the ma the mathematical calculation. So it matters what they say in the interview, but the scoring actually kind of hinges upon what you saw on the charts. And so that's why consensus scoring is important. And that's why it's such a fundamental part of IPS and how we do IPS. Um, because at the end of the day, if we're off one digit on one item, that's no big deal. But if you tack, you know, you tally up 25 different items and we're different on a digit on each item or even three quarters of the items, real quickly, our total scores are gonna be very different, right? Um, so how do you resolve, you have to take it to the item level because you can't really fundamentally resolve Dawn thinking they're scored at a 118, Darren thinking they're scored at a 113, and me thinking they're scored at a 98. That's impossible to resolve. You have to go into the items during consensus scoring and really kind of walk through it and say, what do we think about this one? And Darren's going to say, well, in the interview, they said this, that, and the other. They said, I'll just use a real example. In the interviews, they said they're off-site 85% of the time. And Dawn says, um, you know, that's exactly what they said when I talked to the supervisor and when I talked to the employment specialists. And then they'll say, Paul, what did you see in the charts? And I'll say, well, when I looked in the charts, I saw an awful lot of on-site, in-office activities where they're applying for jobs in the office uh, over the Internet. Um, and a lot of their sessions are done on site. I counted them up. I saw less than, I'll just make up a number, less than 12% of the work that I saw was done off site. And so then, then all of a sudden, now that that information is entered into the conversation, we have to kind of reevaluate that item um, together. Um, 
important things for you to know about consensus scoring. Um, I think if I had to, if there's one thing I want you to remember about what do I need to remember when I score is this one right here. Do not rely on memory. Um, and here's why. Mm -hmm. Once you do uh, six of these in a year, they're all going to blur together when you look back on them. You're not going to remember who said what in what interview um, or any of that stuff. So have some notes. And again, like I said yesterday, they don't have to make sense to anybody but you because you're the one that will sort of say, yeah, this is what my notes say. Um, so you're not going to turn in your notes to Dawn and Darren or anything like that. You're not going to turn in your notes to me. Um, but if we say, hey, you interviewed the uh, the employment specialist, right? You know, what did they say about the career profile? Do they do that over two sessions? Did they say that? Because we didn't see it in the chart. So you just need to know what they said. And again, 25 items might not seem like a lot, but it's two days. It's a flurry of activity. Um, and you're in front of a lot of people doing a lot of interviews, listening to a lot of people. And so it's going to be tough to piece it all together without your notes. So don't rely on your memory. Pretty pleased with sugar on top. Um, it is it is vitally important. You just make some sort of scribble, some scratch, something. Um, and just a tip, what I do, I told you I bring the manual and the uh, fidelity scale with me to every interview or every fidelity review. And the fidelity scale that I bring is kind of like that agency's fidelity scale. Um, I, I told you I have notes on the front by each item and so on and so forth. I also turn it over because it's like, what, seven or eight pages maybe, Dawn and Darren, the fidelity scale alone. Um, I also yep. turn it over and I'll use that just to take notes on the blank backside of the page while I'm doing an interview or um, I might make a note that says need to see uh, job development logs, you know, put a circle around it. Um, mm -hmm. And so it, it, it's while I don't remember any specific fidelity review, if I go pull my my fidelity scale sort of packet um, that I've made notes on for um, whatever agency I've been to um, real quickly, I can refresh my memory on. Oh, yeah, there's this. Oh, yeah, there was that. Um, Absolutely. I've got 17 pages of notes on the review that was done that I did a couple of weeks ago with the team. So if that tells you anything, I've got 17 pages of notes from the two days that I was working on. And then, then I do things a little differently than you, Paul, but you know, similar. I take out the fidelity scale and I do consensus scoring. And I, I ask folks, what do you think the score is and why? Go back through your notes and support that for me kind of a thing. And so we spend time in that consensus scoring meeting each reading through our own notes and gee, Andrea said this and Rachel said that and you know this was in this interview and this was in that interview and did you guys hear that too and so we really really peruse those notes and um, you know use those as we're doing the consensus scoring. Yeah it's important for sure. Um, other yeah, things I, go ahead Darren go ahead. Oh that's that's when you know the notes are really you know the diamonds in the rough so to speak for to be able to go back and pick out some of the information um definitely I know when I'm you know asking questions my note taking isn't as as good as if I have somebody else on the review team you know asking the questions and taking notes so um it, it's kind of striking that back definitely um I'm using more uh, the Word document to do some notes because I like to be able to do the word search a little bit uh, quicker. So I'm I'm blending the two uh, you know models from the legal pad to uh, Word document for uh, note tracking. Well, God bless you. I'm not there yet, but um, you know, take it to the technological <laughs> level. But someday maybe. Uh, <laughs> um, <I don't. laughs> I'm I'm old school. I am um I'm the kind of person that um and I've been like this as long as I can remember in school and everything. <laughs> so there's something that allows me to synthesize things into memory when I hand write them. Um and so yeah. It, so it's good though to hear your point Darren because I think this is a good point to make for you know potential future reviewers like you got to find what works for you. Don't take notes on the fidelity yeah. scale just because it works for Paul. It's got to work for you. So if that means you got to pull out your laptop or your tablet and type some things in, type some things in. Nobody's going to bat an eyelid at it. Um, do what works for you. Um, and it, it is true. You see sort of all types of, I don't know what the right word is, maybe learners or whatever uh, on fidelity reviews because, you know, some people just do chicken scratch like me and other people um, 
who are more sophisticated with their note taking like Darren, um, you, you know, uh, get it done via Microsoft Word and uh, all are appropriate and all are effective. They just, it just has to work for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody brings kind of unique style to the thing. So thank you for the compliment. I don't think I'm quite there, but it it is handy on the scale in the Word document for the Fidelity scale to use the comment uh, tools and that kind of stuff to be able to, like you said, add those notes as we go through the process. And this last one, it really helped me with the, the interview with the supervisor so I could just pull those elements, you know, to the top of the questioning to make sure I got those questions are those anchors answered so I could better do a score reflection when we meet as a team to go over the consensus scoring? Sure, makes a lot of sense. I'll try and I'll let you know how it, how it goes for me. Uh, I, feel <laughs> okay. like I, I feel like I know how it's gonna go, but I'm, I'm okay trying it, we'll see. Um, <laughs> it's rough to start. Yeah, you gotta start, right, somewhere. Um, Number two here is important. You know, we're all going to get stumped and we all continually get stumped. Hey, if you don't believe me, ask Dawn and Darren. Almost every Fidelity review, there's a new thing where I'm kind of like, hmm, what do I do with this? Um, and the short answer is you go to the Fidelity manual, you look it up, you read it, you read through it again, you look through the examples. I've had times where, and I'm sure Darren and Dawn have, um, I don't know how to regard something with, that I've seen or, you know, observed or heard. And I read through the Fidelity manual item and it's kind of like, well, it's not specifically called out here but i look in the examples and lo and behold there's an example of the exact thing i just saw and it says even how i should score it and it's kind of like oh all right easy peasy um i mean that's really that is the definitive reference manual for all fidelity reviewers in the world um so that's where you go um and like i said i think we said it yesterday if you're on a fidelity review um with dawn and someone else and you all are stumped dawn's likely to shoot a text or an email or whatever to darren and say hey what what do we do with this we're, we're all stumped by it what do you think um and that's just the way we all are together as fidelity reviewers um i default to if the client is a preference with something like we'll go with whatever the client prefers um and then at the end of it all sometimes if you don't know you can only score what you know so uh, that's the other thing to consider um, number three, here's another good point that the difference between um, the scores of one and two is not as critical as the scores between three and four or four and five. Um, when you have a score of one on an item, it basically means you haven't really fully implemented it. Maybe it's not present or present in tiny little bits, not, not fully present. So it's not until you get up to three or four or five where you really have to weigh out and look at, is it most of the time or is it some of the time? Because that's what a lot of the fidelity scale differences are between four and three, for example, is that four is most of the time that this thing happens and it says it right there in the scale or a three, a score of three says some of the time it happens. So then you're left with figuring out how often does it happen based on what we've heard. Um, and so you got to just consider all the sources of information. And again, if you're stuck, there's nothing wrong with saying to the team, the IPS team, we're stuck on a particular item. Can you help us? Can you help us with it? And in the example I just gave you, um, where so, you know a score of three might be uh, some of the, some of the time this happens, and a score of four maybe is most of the time this happens. I, I might get to a point, especially on day two, where I bring the IPS supervisor in or the IPS team in and say, we're stuck on this particular item and we're thinking you're somewhere either a three or a four. And really the difference between the two is some of the time or most of the time. Can you help us figure out the frequency of you know whatever this action is? And as we talk that through, then you can say, okay, this is great. We really appreciate it. We think we have what we need to, to put a score down. Thank you. Um, so, you know, that's a resource too, is calling the team back in and asking them follow-up questions. So I just want to make sure I put that out there that, um, you know, you can do all these interviews and still not be 100% certain where you want to score things. So um, number four here is be objective whenever possible, um, you know, and then the best part is number five says when objective information is not 
available, use more than one source. I think that's great. In general, I wish more people would do this in America. Uh, certainly a lot of problems and social ills might be solved if we all started doing this, right? Um, you know, I won't even make any more comments other than that. Um, <laughs> uh, so, you know, if you hear it in one, if you hear something in an interview one place, but you don't see it in the charts, rather than score just what you heard in one interview, like I said, ask someone else, ask the team, ask some in another interview, you know, that you've got lined up where you might be able to glean that information, ask if, if they have any input on it. Um, and so the example they give here is that, you know, you hear from the IPS special work incentives counselor is available to meet with clients. Um, it says reviewers read written benefits planning reports and review a list of people who have received benefits planning. Um, in order to, like we talked um, earlier today, kind of confirm what you've heard. Um, and this further goes on to talk about how they even talk with clients about benefits planning. So, you know, just trust it. But, um, ooh, that was going to be a political quote. I'm not going to say that. Um, uh, just, you know, <laughs> believe what you hear, but also kind of confirm it uh, in a second source. Um, I'm trying to be apolitical in 2021, just to, just in full disclosure. I don't want to have any sort of political tint to anything I say or do. So uh, I want to be right in the middle. Um, let's see here. Number six, when you have conflicting information, what do you do? Um, guess what you do? You follow up, right? Um, so you, you got to talk. You got to continually confirm what you're hearing so that you don't you're not left with trying to score conflicting information where you've got one interview where they say they do it and another interview where they say they don't do it um, because then it's it's really difficult especially those items with any sort of math involved you know how are you going to score it did or it didn't happen right um, uh, so um, when you get uh, sort of different sources of information that provide conflicting information um, Follow that up, make a note of it. That's why your notes are important, right? Um, so that you can have a reliable score. Um, the IPS Works website is, uh, it does have some sort of guidance on scoring. Um, and you can also submit and ask us a question. And I'll admit, there have been times on a fidelity review, like after day one, I've gone to the IPS Works website and kind of scanned around to see if I could find um, input or guidance on a particular fidelity item that's tricky. Um, I, I remember one time um, in Kansas, I was reviewing a place that had a peer run clubhouse with a supported employment IPS team that supported the clubhouse and offered services to those clients, but there was no mental health treatment team and they weren't, their offices weren't on site. And there were just so many sort of different wrinkles to it. Uh, that impacted about six different items that I just, I, I kind of thought, you know, I got to go research basically and just kind of figure out what else has been published on some of this stuff. And it did help clarify it. Um, it did, it did really, it really did help clarify it. So I'm glad I did that, but don't, don't be afraid to use that as a resource uh, either. Um, let's see, number eight is talking about the, the uh, fidelity scale items that require those components like we talked about. Um, and it says here, you know, for example, um, the vocational unit uh, requires several things, and this is in the fidelity manual for that item, but it says for a score of five, the IPS specialist must also provide coverage for each other's caseload. So when you have five components in a particular fidelity scale item, you got to make sure you've seen evidence of all five in order to give them a five. Um, or to give them any of the the one of the components too. I mean, you've got to make sure that you've observed it, heard it in an interview, read it in a chart or something along those lines. Um, um, number nine, this kind of talks more about caseload size um, and how you kind of the rationale for why they take an average of caseload sizes, for example. Um, now we're spending too much time on um, and then number 10 is um, a very important, and I think this is really the underpinning of why Dawn and Darren are kind of with us today to try to get you all sort of coached up into a place where you would feel comfortable being a fidelity reviewer. Fidelity reviews are important, and it's you know certainly important to, during a fidelity review, to um, have some validity to the score you give an organization, but beyond that, 
the next time fidelity reviewers come in, if, if we don't have sort of a pipeline set up with fidelity reviewers receiving consistent training and consistent observation and consistent opportunities to be a fidelity reviewer, one of the risks you might have is when Dawn and Darren and Paul review agency ABC123, they give them, let's say, a score of 115. And then when three other reviewers come in next year, they give them a score of an, you know, 99, you know, because we're not consistent with each other as reviewers. Um, and it's really important, especially, I know this one talks about specifically if nothing's changed from one year to the next, um, how consistency is important. But it's also important just from a general consistency uh, sort of perspective that when Dawn and Darren go do fidelity reviews, that they're seeing things in a similar way, interpreting things in a similar way. It's likewise the same that when I or anyone else on this call um, goes to an organization to provide a fidelity review, that we're interpreting things the way that is sort of the standard interpretation. And that's the way to do that is that we all lean on the manual. We all lean on IPS Employment Center resources. And we have an opportunity where as reviewers, we can kind of help each other out. And I think that the groundwork is being laid for that right now. Um, and Dawn and Darren certainly chime in if I'm off base on all of that, but it is extremely important that, I know you've heard us say that we take our, our roles seriously as fidelity reviewers, but we have to show up um, in a really important way when we step foot onto a fidelity review, uh, because the agency score depends on the work we've put into becoming a fidelity reviewer. Um, so for all of you that were so kind yesterday to say, I just want to get it right. I don't want to screw it up. I don't want to make a mistake. Um, and I think I might have unfortunately shared for you that you will make a mistake at some point and, and that's okay. You're human. So what do you do if there's a past more scoring mistake? Like you get there to a fidelity review and you realize the last reviewers interpreted something differently than maybe they could have. Um, all you do is you acknowledge the past sort of error um, and you score it as accurately as possible now that you're there and you know it, right? Um, it doesn't happen all the time. Um, it happens infrequently, I, I would say at best. Um, but, you know, own it. Um, it's not right or wrong. No agency is going to be upset because you're correcting a wrong score, I promise. Um, and the challenge is if you're correcting a score that was maybe artificially high, like if somebody got a five in the last fidelity review and when you're there, nothing's changed, but you're really looking at it and seeing that it's a four, um, you know, you can, the, be, the best thing you can do is be honest, I guess, let's put it that way. Um, and just call it out and you don't have to blame the last set of reviewers by saying, well, they screwed it up, don't be mad at me or whatever. Um, this is all about interpreting and it's all about, remember too, um, what people show us when we're present. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, even if somebody got a point for having a brochure last year, if they don't show me a brochure this year, I'm not going to give them a point for the brochure. I can't. Um, so uh, those, those are some considerations. Um, you already know to score all the items. Um, and then the last one here, don't adjust scores for local factors. Um, and we've talked about some sort of local circumstances or sort of Washington specific circumstances. Um, we can certainly make note of that in the narrative and we can say, um, uh, teams got a lower score on diversity of employers because of the rural setting and smaller job market. We can totally make that comment. We can make that comment in the item and we can make it in the general summary. Um, so, you know, so that there's almost like a disclaimer for the organization. Uh, but like we've said before, at the end of it all, uh, the fidelity scale is the fidelity scale and there's not really, while there is flexibility in it, there, there are some areas where there's really not any uh, flexibility that, you know, in the scoring part of it. Um, this portion of the manual goes through the required agency documentation and sort of um, supported employment program documentation. That'll be provided for you. And Dawn, Darren, I'm not sure about your experience, but my experience pre-COVID is you go to an organization and often 
uh, all, a lot of this documentation that we need to see from them is kind of assembled in big three ring binders. And they say, well, here's all of our newsletters. Here's all of our brochures. Here's all of our, you know, whatever's here's all of our whatever's. And then at some point you just have time to kind of flip through that um, during your review. Yeah, now it's mostly about some large PDF files uh, that are sent and then distributed uh, so that we can take a look at during some of the, you know, prior to consensus scoring or during consensus scoring to kind of see what we need to refer to. So definitely a lot of file sharing, and I've learned that some agencies can only accept uh, so much uh, data uh, sets at a time, and sometimes it takes multiple uh, transfers of PDFs. Sure. That's the the new normal, right? Now, now instead of me kind of internally sighing when I see a giant, you know, six inch three ring binder, um, now I can internally sigh when somebody sends me a file that's like a bajillion, uh, you know, size wise, it's huge. So um, <laughs> still got to read it. Doesn't matter yeah. if it's in a three ring binder or if it's in your email inbox, you still got to read it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the manual goes on to talk about some um, different considerations like IPS programs that employ peers. Um, what do you do when uh, or what to do when an IPS program um, has a mental health team or a treatment team that they support that's not at the same agency that's in an external agency. Um, but I wanted to just kind of mo move into writing the report. And Dawn talked about the, this a little bit. And I think Darren even talked about this a little bit. Um, the reality is the report's not uh, difficult to write. It's one of those things that is a challenge because you kind of have to put some polish to it and you, you know, you have to make it, uh, you have to formalize sort of your notes if you want to think about it that way. And um, it's the official evidence that the fidelity review happened. Um, and as we talked, we want to make sure that it's, um, you know, uh, a report that highlights strengths and isn't just filled with all the stuff that we thought we would flag them on because we didn't see the evidence of it. Um, so it's good to have balance with the fidelity report. Um, there are some great examples that are uh, already put together on the IPS Works website. Um, and it's important to know a couple things. One, um, provide evidence for your scores. Um, you don't have to um, get down to the nitty gritty of it. Um, but if, you know, like this one says, if you scored a three, explain why it was a three. Um, it was a three because when we looked at everything, you know, the IPS specialists shared their schedules, et cetera, et cetera. They're spending less than 40% of their time in the community. Um, so you provide that explanation. Um, and I think it's a comments field, if I remember right, that's on the Fidelity Report where you can do that under each item. Um, and then for everything lower than a five, it's our duty to sort of recommend, um, you know, a, a plan or um, a recommendation for that item. So um, anything you can do to keep it specific, measurable. Um, a lot of reports I've seen really tie the recommendation to the fidelity scale language, which I think can be helpful. Um, you know, so when it says, uh, you know, the... Um, well, here's a couple of few, right? Uh, so discuss the possible benefits and risks of disclosure of a disability with all people served. That's a good, solid recommendation. Or include consumers and family members in the IPS steering committee membership. Another good um, recommendation here. Um, when there's a, you know, if somebody scores a one, uh, it this talks about, you know, when there's a large gap, how it's important to recommend kind of a small step or a series of small steps as opposed to you know, what it would look like going from one all the way to five. Um, so, because uh, that's how it goes at organizations. They don't, you don't review them one year and see that they're, you know, all ones, and then you come back next year and they're all fives. Uh, what happens is they have some fives, they have some fours, some threes, some twos, and some ones maybe even. And over time, the ones become twos or the ones become threes. So maybe some of the threes become fours. It's really incremental change. Um, you always begin with a summary of the fidelity review, and this is um, sort of an example of what it looks like. Uh, so this item, you'd have the rating on the fidelity report, and this is really sort of a, uh, a document that you can fill out electronically where you would enter the three here. You wouldn't have to type this whole thing up, uh, and then you could check the box, check the box um, for each component that they were awarded a point for. 
Um, and then, yeah, it gives you a comments section you can type into, and then you would recommend um, what they could do to increase their score. Um, help agency leaders use the report to improve services. I'll just touch on this by saying um, each state really gets to define what that help looks like. Um, often that is statewide training that is offered, you know, when you're a fidelity reviewer. Um, but as far as agency specific help, um, that is, um, I don't want to say less likely. It, it's just, it's sort of kind of like individualized. Um, in Illinois, there's IPS trainers. So if my organization was really, really struggling with particular fidelity uh, scale items, at the end of my fidelity review, they might offer to connect me to one of the state IPS trainers to get some specific guidance on the items uh, my organization is struggling with. I'm not sure if, uh, like Dawn and Darren, if you guys are considered IPS trainers for your state or if, or if there would be other entities um, that are the trainers. I, I think Dawn yeah. and I are it. <laughs> You're it. All right. So everybody email them. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean, every state's a little bit different. And at the end of the day, like we've talked about, it's up to the agency. Um, you know, they, they kind of control their, their destiny on the fidelity score. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, also, if any of you emailed Darren and Dawn and said, gosh, we're really struggling with this item. Can you help us? I'm sure they would do whatever they could to help you kind of sort it out or, you know, put a game plan together. Um, so that is, I'm going to, um, I'm going to pull up a copy of the fidelity report and then maybe it's worth just turning it over to Dawn and Darren and you guys certainly can add anything you'd like. Um, if people have questions, I'm happy to answer questions at this point um, about anything we've talked about. It's an awful lot that we've covered, I know. Uh, and nobody expects you to remember all of it, you know, and have total recall from memory. So um, let us know what's going through your brain right now as you're as we're kind of wrapping up today. Um, and I'll just turn it over to Dawn and Darren at this point. Wonderful. Um, so yeah, you, while folks are asking questions, I would just say, um, I know there have been a question about, you know, kind of what support do you get during the review? Um, I'll mention again, either Darren or myself are the lead reviewers on every review that's done for supported employment in the state at this point in time. What we're hoping in the future is to build uh, a stable workforce of reviewers that, um, as you gain expertise, could potentially be a lead reviewer and kind of take on, on uh, that role. We're not there yet. Right now, it's Darren and I are the lead reviewers, and then um, the folks that are attending the trainings and are uh, contracting with the healthcare authority are the ones that are ending up being the fidelity members that are part of the team. Um, we do meet with team members prior to the reviews typically, uh, unless somebody's been pretty experienced. Uh, for the new folks we meet and answer questions and things. Um, I have to say that, that within our schedule limitations, we're pretty available uh, if you have questions and, and need to get together. And then when we do the consensus scoring, it's a meeting after the fact. Um, we set aside however many hours we set aside, uh, and everybody on the team has an equal say. Uh, you know, we'd be a tiebreaker if there needs to be one, but everybody's viewpoint is important. Everybody's notes are important. Um, everybody has a say in the final uh, score for each of the items on on the two, team that you're on. Um, and then as far as, you know, I'm, I'm actually doing consensus scoring with the team from the last review I did right after this. And um, yep. two of the team members are feeling very confident about writing reports. And so we're gonna get together separately just to, to kind of spend a little more time talking about what do you, what do you write, how do you write it, um, that kind of thing. So lots of support, I guess is what I would say. Yeah, there's a lot of flexibility in terms of going through things, but always, you know, we encourage people to ask questions or ask for assistance and provide feedback because everybody will get some type of an assignment to respond to one of the elements, make some comments and recommendations. Um, and then sometimes I ask for some more information from the that writer, that team member. And then there's also the availability to look at the final draft. 
uh, to set that out prior to sending that to the agency. So we really want to make it as inclusive as possible uh, for the review um, to, to provide a really good package for some really good recommendations for the agency. Um, and some of those resources, definitely, that's one thing I've really uh, liked about the teams I've been on with the uh, teams I've worked with, Don's team, is that so many people bring different resources that can be shared uh, during the review, and I like to incorporate those into the report as well. Definitely. I see Rebecca asked Paul for his email address for future questions. So Paul, if you're, if you're up for that and want to put your email address in the, the chat box, um, if you'd prefer to send the information to Darren and I and we forward along, um, that's an option too. Um, I would prefer yeah. that so that, um, and so I had a situation where not in the state of Washington, but um, we did something like this in a different state where we did a training and then I had people asking me questions that were specific to that state that really needed to be answered by right. somebody other than Paul. And so I'm not saying people can't reach out to me. I'm just saying if if you and Darren wouldn't mind making sure that if it's a Washington specific question, you know, you can provide the answer because um, I, I would just have to send them back to you anyway. Sure. Sure. Right. Yeah, no, not. I appreciate it. So what other questions do people have? As Paul mentioned, we know this is a lot of information. Yeah. Um, and the truth of the matter is you're still going to get opportunity to ask questions during reviews. One of the things we've done, because the virtual review is a little different, when we were face-to-face, -face, like I'd say, you'd sit in a room together, the people you were interviewing would leave, and then you'd have a little kind of conversation about what, you, what did you see, what did you hear, are we lacking information, just all that stuff that's sort of missing with the Zoom meetings. So we've, I, I know I've tried to incorporate kind of a check-in separate meeting that I set up and invite the reviewers only so that we can talk each day a little bit and, and try and go over, you know, kind of any concerns or questions that, that folks have. This is a learning experience for you. Over and above the fact that you're ending up doing part of a review, this is, this is intended to be part of the learning collaborative. And so I take very seriously that my role as a mentor and, um, you know, kind of sharing information with folks about why we're looking at what we're looking and how we do it and, um, and all of that kind of thing. So that's available to you during the review as well, just not necessarily obviously in front of the people that we're interviewing. Um, <laughs> and the truth of the matter is, we're still working out bugs. This, um, and I think whether I think whether you're face to face or doing things virtually, you still try and perfect things over time. New, new and better practices come up on a regular basis, but particularly. With this fidelity review process, I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around some of the ways that we can do things that were so easy when we were face to face that are not quite as easy right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a really strange yeah. time for us all right now. Mm -hmm. And I, people just need to be a um, you know a level of awareness that there's a lot of fatigue that goes on into back to back to back virtual interviews so definitely I start my day off with a big cup of coffee but also have my water uh, you know uh, available too just because you know staying hydrated staying focused and there is you know definitely some fatigue um, and not all agencies have the same uh, sophistication of technology that uh, definitely I, I've had interviews where people just call in so we're I'm very grateful that MS Teams now has that availability with the HCA for the call-in feature because we utilize that. So um, it's it's still, you know, I'm still learning, you know, to, in the second year of doing this and trying to organize and share more information, just like having the training today. But we're all learning together on this new process. Right. Absolutely. For sure. Um, I thought I saw a question come in. What's the future? <clears throat> so, Paul, what, what we know at this point in time is that our leadership has put in a request for an extension of the 1115 um, transformation project, the 1115 waiver. 
and we're awaiting on a response for that. Um, I was in a meeting the other day. They talk about sustainability on a regular basis. We talk about sustainability on a regular basis and ways that we might achieve that. Um, right at the moment, um, it's making that request for the extension to the 1115 uh, transformation waiver. One of the nice things is that Medicaid has a variety of waivers, 1915I and uh, C, and you know I think they go halfway through the alphabet with the different um, 1915 waivers and the 1115 waiver. And I heard something new the other day, and I'm not saying it's going to happen, um, but I was I was interested in hearing the fact that uh, I think it's Arizona. Uh, the 1115 transformation waiver is supposed to be a five-year waiver. Um, they've had five extensions of the five-year waiver. <laughs> oh, boy. So, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I, they're kind of an anomaly, but, um, you know, it's we have the discussions on a regular basis. There is every intent, and I can tell you Melody Pays um, is amazing. I have never known a person that's as good at uh, figuring out funding as is Melody, and she's she's leading the charge for uh, sustainability. So I feel sure. confident. Yeah, she's um, really sharp. Her. Oh, she is amazingly sharp. I want to be her when I grow up. I mean, <laughs> Me truthfully. too, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Does that? It looks like that might have answered your question, Paul. It sounds like it. Hopefully, made sense. What other questions do we have? Hopefully, you know, I guess I'll put out there, Dawn, that I hope people after day two feel at least a little bit of that anxiety they were expressing to us yesterday, you know, has kind of been addressed and maybe they're not, you know, 100% ready to jump into the deep end with us, but, um, you know, with some additional opportunities to sharpen their skills, um, feel like it's it's a doable thing for them now, whereas maybe before it felt like a real tall order. Right. Absolutely I mean, I point. will tell people that I, I am, I'm here in front of you and I don't have any sort of special skill or wisdom. All I have is experience doing this. There's really no, um, you know, there's no special muscle I exercised to know about fidelity reviewing other than I did a bunch of fidelity reviews. Um, I have done a bunch and I continue to do a bunch. Um, so uh, you all have all of the capability that certainly I have and, you know, Dawn and Darren, I don't know if you have some sort of special microchip implanted that allows you to do um, <laughs> fidelity reviews, but I suspect it's a lot of reading and training and doing them observation and experience. Right. Now I will say that I have a good fortune of when, when I was, uh, when I worked at Grant Integration, Grant Integrated Services, we were one of, one of the best grant sites. And part of the training that came along with it, that is that Sandy Reese, who is one of the original developers of IPS, actually sure. came and did a whole agency training for, for the agency that I worked for. Um, I was able to go out on three fidelity reviews with her. Um, and so I don't know how I could have been so lucky uh, as to have, you know, actually accessed um, her knowledge and experience and expertise and was an amazing opportunity. And I still learn every review I go on. I, I hear people talk about some of the things that they're doing that are amazing in my mind. And frankly, I steal from those and share with other agencies <laughs> because we all want we we want all of the agencies to succeed. Because the bottom line is, we're in it because we care about changing the lives of of people that are served and improving the quality of life of people that are served by helping them become successfully employed in something that they enjoy doing, their dream job. Sure. Um, and so we want to make sure that everybody has that level playing field and has similar knowledge so that they can do their very best. I think that is a good piece about Fidelity. It really brings like-minded people with the same passions together to really focus on, you know, changing the lives of the people throughout Washington and across the country with IPS um, throughout the nation. So Angel said, um, or on hell, I'm not sure which, um, uh, what are the other opportunities? I'm, uh, elaborate for me a little bit, if you would. I'm, I'm not sure what, uh, unless I I'm kind just, of in, um, I kind of interpreted that, Dawn, as you know, other opportunities to continue learning about being a fidelity reviewer. 
Okay. Um, but that's just my uh, interpretation. And I will say the healthcare authority has numerous trainings, uh, webinars that happen every month. Some of them are regularly scheduled, like every second Thursday at nine o'clock is the job developers. Um, uh, learning collaborative call and it's really intended to be a little more interactive so if you're having troubles with job development you have successes you want to share you can do it in that that format um, every third Thursday is a topical employment webinar from 8 30 to 10 um, every second Monday is the supervisors learning collaborative and it alternates between supportive housing and supported employment uh, this month we have the great good fortune of Rutgers doing uh, a series of trainings on golden thread and documentation. Um, um, our very own Darren and Dawn are going to do the topical employment webinar on career profile. And the fact that it's not just that, <laughs> that it that it is the opportunity to get to know a person and build a relationship and really help them identify their dream job. So it's a career profile and so much more. So we're gonna we're gonna present information on that. Um, if you are not signed up for our distribution list, please send me or Darren your email address and we'll make sure you get added. Um, and then uh, you know, you'll have the, the access to, all, to registering for all those different trainings. Thanks, Harrison. I see you're on your way out. Um, yeah, thank you. You're, you're welcome, Angel. Yeah, good. Some good comments. It's good to hear. Glad people got some time. Thanks everyone for being here. We're now a couple of minutes over, but that's, I consider that on time. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> so I'll send out the email. Um, you'll have an uh, opportunity to respond with your email address if you need to get signed up for our distribution list. And Darren and Paul, if you have suggestions about documents I need to, to attach to the email, let me know. But at a minimum, it's gonna be the fidelity scale, the manual and the chart review form. Yep. I think those well, are good I'll for now. I'll send you the thread, Don. Send me the what? I'm sorry. Just the golden thread link to add to the email. Okay, marvelous. Good, good, good. Thanks all. Have a all good right. day. Thanks everybody. If everybody's Thanks, Paul. done with what they had to say, I'm gonna end the the uh, webinar. Awesome. Bye, Have all. a great day, everybody. Bye. Do, do, do.